The condition is really crazy condition. I mean, I shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Mateo Yakino giving up one elbow around for his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team has just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode 24. And this week, we have a simmer style legend. In a time where people are changing brands from year to year, this guy has been on one brand for over 30 years. He was there at pretty much the first ever jaw session and still charges the place today. Um, We talk about um, who is his dream team, if he could pick the ultimate dream team. Uh, We talk about commentary and how he's after my job. Uh, We also talk about lots of other stuff, uh, especially his speed drumming and how he was voted or he won the fastest drummer in the world at one point. Who is it? It is, of course, Kai Kachadorian. Kai Kachadurian is in the house. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for finding the time, for coming on. Managed to do our little time zone thing. Yeah. Early morning, Europe evening, all good. How are you doing? Aloha from Maui. Uh, great to be here and uh, thanks for having me. I'm used to that time difference, always communicating with my wife and family. So this is nothing new. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously people that follow you on social media would probably notice your back and forth kind of Hawaii, Finland, Finland, Hawaii. Um, It's a nice contrast, isn't it? I don't think you get two different, more different places in the world, weather-wise and, you know, also waves and wind and all that sort of stuff. How's that dynamic working for you? Yeah, I mean, you understand perfectly, Machek, as I call you Baltic brother. We're sitting there in the Baltic, you in Poland and me in in the Gulf of Finland. and. Finland's actually where I originally learned how to windsurf uh, back when I was about 12 years old. And that definitely, uh, that time in Europe, the early 80s, you know, uh, there were a lot of windsurfers around there. But, you know, you saw the Hawaii image already permeating in the promotion of stuff, you know, Mistral, everybody's, you know, Diamond Head, Sunny, Tropical. And uh, you could see that that translated really well in Europe. The, the, The word that you used was contrast. That's exactly right. And it's a balance of contrasts. Uh, One that requires some timing. Uh, Obviously, you can't be in two places at once, especially these days. So uh, I haven't been back to Maui since uh, January, nine months gone. And luckily, uh, my whole fluid situation that I have uh, allows it. But I waltzed into a really big window. My arms are sore. I've been sailing constantly. And, uh, you know, I had actually been doing a lot of windsurfing back in Finland. They had a really good summer. You might have gotten a big piece of some of those southwesterlies we were getting over there and even a couple of northwesterlies. I could go on and on about all the dynamics, but they do contrast well. And uh, as long as your timing's on, you can branch off from other places. I mean, there's places I get to from Finland that I would never even be able to reach from Maui that easily. So, you know, it's all about the timing. Yeah, I think you told me about a direct flight to Cabo Verde. Obviously, that's off the table now, but um, but you did score like some cheeky little Scandinavian waves. Yeah. Do you feel like, I don't know, I kind of feel like it's some of the most unexplored coastline still and, and there's good waves there to be had and probably, you know, even more for windsurfing than... Then maybe for surfing, I don't know. It just looked looked like you scored, and it looks like I don't know. When I look at the map and I, how I look at you know how how the how the systems develop, and it just seems like there's a lot of potential there. And I know you've done some exploring, so tell me a little bit about that. It's you know two bodies of water: uh, the Northern Baltic uh, versus the Gulf of Finland, and those are two fetches that are we're directly related. Uh, in that sense. I mean, we like our Southwests and uh, that's a pattern, so to speak. Uh, What we're really dealing with though, is the difference between wave sailing and windsurfing. You know what I mean? And I think that cuts off, that cuts off to me, theoretically, 
when you're riding ground swell and wind swell. I talk about this all the time. Well, you know, the Baltic, it's wind swell world. And I kind of cut off, like, if you're in single digits on wave period, you know, one to nine seconds, it's wind swell. That's double my territory. <laughs> double digits, 10 seconds, then you're that's in. That's your you territory. Know, well, so that's, that's the rule of thumb. And, you know, 99% of the time in the Baltic, it's wind swell. So where I am and where I learned how to windsurf is uh, our family summer home, which is about two hours outside of Helsinki on the south part. And the last group of islands, it's all open water. So from a very early on, when I would revisit as a proficient windsurfer, I would start, you know, sailing upwind around the corner into the mouth of the Gulf of Finland. And lo and behold, uh, after, you know, a few summers of doing it, uh, I started discovering some windswell slab spots that absolutely amazed me. Um, I, you know, won't get into exact locations, but I have actual surfing waves that when it's, you know, 2.5 meters or bigger, I'm getting 90 meter rides, you know, paddling into these little slabs. Granted, like, you can damage some pretty expensive boards with the rocks that you have to paddle over, right? That's the reality around there, but uh, it, you know, for windsurfing, there's these outer slabs you can cruise around. You just have to be a little mindful. It's not some trade wind. It's a frontal low that's blowing only so long. You have to read the sides if the wind's going to die and you've sailed two miles, you know, away or whatever. You know, you, you, I'm sure you've got some stories. I, I love your Kanaha story. I remember uh, that, that night, you know, you swam in from far away. It doesn't, it's not exclusive to the Baltic, no. But uh, it, Finland's a really, like, uh, mobile tribe of windsurfers and they follow the wind around i'm kind of not in that situation because in my opinion where i am at our summer home is probably like the best place to be we sail on almost all points of the compass except northwest when it's northwest i'll drive three hours to this place called pori and surrounding environments and there's just a ton of places you can go there and it doesn't even stop at finland uh, as you know i went up to norway recently uh, uncorked the Lofoten Islands and wave sailed up there for the first time, uh, my first time and one of the first times at some of these breaks. And that's just, you know, we're talking about the Arctic Circle now. And that's, you know, that's a whole different situation and territory and exploration is really high on my list. I mean, wind swell or ground swell, it's like, I love Maui and I'm getting back, you know, in touch with Maui here and, and using using my time wisely in terms of being able to you know branch out on some of the other spots you can sail here as well but uh it, it's it's definitely also very familiar to me finally you know even after this long being gone that you know there, there are other places that are always on my mind and uh like i keep saying you can't be in two places at once especially now so you have to really kind of carve out your window and uh you know keep keep rolling where you like to sail and I mean for me it's even more about the equipment and what you're using where I'm starting to stash boards everywhere I go I've got I've got a quiver of boards in in Cabo Verde I've got a, a bunch of boards here I would have been screwed I came back Lufthansa uh, had my gear delayed in San Francisco for the week well sort of like that but I had gear here luckily waiting for me and then luckily it was four seven or I wouldn't have been sailing. So yeah. What is it? What is it about exploration and about, I guess the first part of the question is why do you feel, think it feels so good when you score something that you just, you know, might not be that amazing. Like it, yeah. it might not be Hokipa level or, or whatever, but you put in all that effort to, to find it and you're probably alone and, and whatever, and maybe you have a beautiful backdrop or something, you know, just different. And the second part of it is like, how do you become good at that? Because I talked to Thomas Traversa on this, on this show and he's like, yeah, it's just my hobby. I go on Google earth and I just, <laughs> I just spent hours there, you know, and looking at forecasts and whatever. So how, how, how is that for you? Google Earth, right back at you, and TT there, you know, like Tomas, the prototype of somebody who's, you know, gotten the work behind him in terms of the world championship and can kind of move on. He's a father, two beautiful daughters, and he, he, he 
he checks the maps and, and in a way, I think there's a little hometown pride too, like, especially in his own home zones, you know, like he recently scored France or whatnot and Portugal, obviously his latest exploit in Nazareth is historical. I mean, hats off. And, you know, like the, I think it was apparent early on, I mean, uh, staying and the fact that with, he has to go right there, you know, like right, you, you right into the cliff, there. you know, talk about going on the rocks. You know, that that's that's his exclusive territory. That's the thing I'm getting at is that like even with the, you know, Red Bull Storm chases that he was, you know, basically dominating in one form or another, uh, you know, he was just it came became apparent that in these very extreme conditions, here's this, you know, diminutive guy on micro equipment, totally comfortable and I mean, just like taming it. And not even that, but going, you know, radical next level in it. And, and so that's made a huge impression on everybody, I'm sure. Uh, and, you know, definitely some of these things about like, you know, some of the places Fabian Ohm, right? He's telling me, he's like, yeah, I, Tom, I was sealing up to Jaws once. And I was like, wow, man, that's kind of sketchy, you know, like. Obviously, everybody's, you know, watching him. That's supposed to say, oh, yeah, that's nothing. You should see what he does in France. He's like three hours next to this, you know, one, you know, hell forgotten cliff that he gets, you know, a little session at and then has to, you know, hike home or something. So that's, you know, I think we're taking that a bit to the extreme. I'm sure he would tell you too. He needs to kind of slow down on the life risking activities there because you can definitely find yourself in the middle of nowhere going, oh, yeah, I scored. And then like, now what? You know, yeah. there are, there are limits to it. Um, you kind of have to, you know, get back to where you started from. Right. Uh, it's going to be really interesting though. I I've kept in touch, you know, uh, talking about Cabo Verde, for instance, one of my regular hits normally. And, you know, I've been in touch with Josh and Google a lot, just, you know, tracking swells and they're getting started with their season there. And there's a lot of places to explore there as well. Um, you know, without naming names, it's not just limited to Sol for sure. And Tomas has been around there too. So the exploration thing to get back at your original question, uh, I think the incentive really is to, uh, it's, it's kind of twofold. You always do wonder what's out there. And I think uh, the curiosity for me becomes overwhelming at a certain point. When you see, when you're able to, you know, see certain forecasts, here's this big low pressure that just fired off a swell in a certain direction that you might not always see. And you're like, I wonder what happened over there in Kamchatka or something, you know, like, and you know, it's you, FOMO, you, right? <laughs> sort of. I mean, you don't know really. Uh, I, there was a time where I would have only been limited to caring about what was happening in the Northern Pacific. And, and, you know, that was it. Uh, that quickly changed the first time I went to Cabo Verde though in 96. And that was pretty early on in the whole deal. Uh, and, and from there, that really sparked it for me. I mean, uh, even just places you can sail in your local old haunts like California, certain different combinations pop up and then, you know, you, uh, you're able to take a look at certain spots. It's kind yeah. of the nature of it. Is it, is it really good, Cali like um, California? Because it, it is a little bit forgotten, isn't it? Like it used to be, I guess quite a lot of people sailing and it kind of whatever we see is kind of always a little bit side on shorey but I bet like we don't see the best places <laughs> I think you don't see the best places uh, obviously uh, I, I would be the first person to tell you that there is a protective nature to some of the places I mean where I'm originally from is the northern California coastline above Santa Cruz and you, your impression of, you know, California might be more Southern California based uh, for whatever reason, but I mean, Waddell Creek, uh, you know, and surrounding locations there uh, certainly get really, really good and proper down the line. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, I agree though, uh, overall, there's a general, you know, side on shore quality to the wave riding and it's not always ground swell, it's wind swell. What's cool about California is you get all these combination swells. You know, a classic day at Waddell might include like, a 18 second period four foot south swell that's combining with this you know slow rolling northwest wind swell and you just get these ridiculous setups that are you know rolling from the north bowl two bottom turns into this south death bowl that just goes sand pipe bam, blast the thing you know you really learn how to hit the lip at a place like that because you're dealing with all these different elements 
it's a really cool spot. I mean, like, you know, it's kind of the equivalent of a Gin show, for instance. With the lone exception that it actually blows all day. It doesn't start windy at seven o'clock like the Nortada. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned um, you mentioned um, San Francisco, Santa Cruz area. Um, that's where you're originally from, I guess. I couldn't. Yeah. There's not much. There's not much internet info about the old flycatcher, and um, and I, I I felt like normally I call around and I ask around, and I'm like, shit, let him just tell his story, you know, <laughs> like let him just tell how he got to Maui. And how that whole windsurfing, you already said you, you actually started windsurfing in Finland, which I had no clue about. I thought it was just, you know, maybe San Francisco Bay Area or something. And then, okay, I wanna, we want to windsurf. Let's go to Maui or whatever. So, so how was that? How, how did you actually land in there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it, I, let, let's say we started that story already with me learning how to windsurf in Finland. Well, you know, then the rest of the year, I'm uh, a kid growing up in Palo Alto, California, in the Bay Area, which is notoriously windy. I will call the San Francisco Bay Area the most hands down as far as an urban windsurfing environment. It's the best place in the world. Bring on a, a racing event there, please. Oh, that would be so sad. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, you know, yes. Can't wait to see you there. Uh, you know, I've seen many, done a few. And as far as the diversity of, of wind and everything, that really hits home. So I was, I was, you know, once I had learned in Finland, and we're talking about like 83, 84 here, what's happening with windsurfing in 83 and 84 is that it is going through quantum leaps of development and it's leaving the entry level behind. Here comes the camber inducer, here, here comes the RAF, here comes the, you know, the, the bull bat and sail, here comes monofilm. Where's the beginner board? It's all this, you know, I learned, I learned on the narrowest, unstable long board as a, you know, 11 year old kid falling off constantly. You know, it's these things that, you know, you realize that, you know, your grace and balance get you through more than anything. Anyway, so the Bay Area, really uh toughened me up sailing waddell by about 15 uh in the winter time uh really you know got me but i was also looking at maui memorizing every magazine you know totally dead set there was a waddell wave contest where the wetter brothers and eric sharp and ian boyd showed up and ian boyd in particular uh had this model yeah you know this he had moved from california and gone to high school as a 14 year old and uh, once I met Ian and, you know, quizzed him for hours about his situation, it became apparent that that was maybe something I wanted to kind of try and pull off. So that summer I went to the gorge with my mom to race in the pro-am. And I met this photojournalist uh, by the name of Arleon Dibinia, very, very kind woman who just immediately, you know, answered all my questions and elaborated on and gave me all this information. Actually, I was kind of like, you know, before I even hinted, you know, she kind of just drew me into this, like, yeah, I can find you a family, you know? So behind my parents' back that fall after the gorge, I kind of had it all lined up. I, I figured out with our Leon, you know, a, a family to, uh, wasn't it, it was a husband and wife, Ron and Diane Sondate at the time, and they uh, took me in as a 16 year old uh, in Paia. So really all this, all this mattered at this point was that my sister Nina had gone off to college already. It was just myself and my parents in the house over there at Stanford. And I was going sailing at Waddell every day, driving an hour to go do it. So uh, once I had all my info down, okay, I'm going to go to Baldwin High School and I, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to Maui. I'm a Howley kid. Here we go. We're going to take on the world, right? And, and so I, you know, I dropped it to my parents. I was like, I've got this all figured out. And, you know, was lucky enough, you know, to, to, to know Ian Boyd and they had met him and I used him as, you know, a key example. Well, this wasn't an immediate yes or no answer either. Uh, I just remember that that particular fall, there was a lot of windsurfing going on at Waddell. I was doing a lot of driving as a 15 year old, you know, running over the hill and hot, you know, like, yeah. In, in, my, Europe, huh? in Europe, you can't even fathom that like a 15 or a 16 year old, you know, like driving I, to, to win sure let alone that we were, were going to let him just move to maui the o'neill invitational was coming up and that was kind of this earmark where i had used the o'neill as kind of like okay i want to compete in the o'neill if i can and 
you know, I might be better off doing a whole, you know, semester there because I can train and, and get used to it. Oh, and by the way, mom, I saw a half eaten elephant seal on the beach at uh, Waddell today, a great white shark attack. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, you know, I, I, that would have been an interesting uh, viewpoint watching my parents debate that with their friends, you know, in the uh, affluent Stanford educational community. There'd be a couple of people who'd be like, yes, you should give them the chance. There'd probably be a lot of like, hell no kind of responses. It's a really, you know, educated background and let's just say that that, you know, did not resonate with everybody there, but yeah. Uh, you know, it came back as a yes. And, and so my mom, you know, flew me over there at the end of January uh, and I was there and uh, not windy right away, but getting slowly acclimated. But uh, the first day I sailed Hukipa, there was one other person out and it was a pretty hairy day. Uh, I remember it was this uh, really blusterly kind of Northeast day and I was actually out alone for a little while. And then someone else buzzed out. And it's Laird Hamilton. He was out there windsurfing with me, you know, giving me the stare down. Who, are, who is this kid? And, you know, maybe like five minutes after that, he zooms around. I remember vividly that, like, I, I was up at Mills and, like, a 10-foot set came in. There's my mom watching on the beach. You know, this 10-foot set comes in. And I'm closing out. And I just barely squeaked over the thing and and you know survived that obviously and then uh went on the rocks for some dumb reason after that it was like the set should have cleaned me up but that was that you know i was dialed in i did the o'neill uh there was a junior world's competition i started you know sierra emery rush randall became you know really good friends of mine you know brought brought me under their wing sasha maye you know the angulo brothers obviously all three of them mark josh and andy uh what Baldwin High School was like was a little rough. And what I remember about Baldwin, you know, being a public school, is I kind of sold that to my folks. And that would, might have been the element that, that, you know, they were not comfortable with because I kind of came in there as a Howley kid. And it's survival back then. They had fully had Kill Howley Day going on. And, uh, you know, me and Micah Buzinus were, were, were running for our lives. Uh, it was hairball, but we ended up uh, transferring to a Catholic high school called St. Anthony, which is actually where all the windsurfers ended up going. That's where Ian went, you know, for a while, Eric Sharp and all these other people. So that allowed you uh, to have a little more time off. It was a little more lenient, smaller school. You have to wear a uniform, so you know, get out of school, rip off your uniform, get in your shorts, drive to go keep or Kanaha. And that was a good existence, and that was, you know, Maui and Hokipa in the late eighties, which was phenomenal. And, uh, you know, tightened up my relationship with Simmer style, which, you know, still today is going, which is, you know, kind of the origin of that. I kind of got handed off from the California distributor to Maui. So I met Malta and Klaus and, you know, started, you know, continuing that whole journey, but it wasn't, you know, I think my parents did a good job in, in, in forcing me to kind of, you know, look at what it would take to, not just rely on sailing. You know, I had, I, I had job, you know, even at like 16 or 17, I washed dishes at this French restaurant called La Vie en Rose, which everybody who back in the day was on Maui will remember. Uh, it's this phenomenal place in Paia, this whole culture behind it, really amazing place. And like, yeah, you know, you're going to high school, you're working La Vie en Rose, even working high tech rentals a bit and sailing. And that's what it was all about. And uh, I remember finally all that was going on back then. You just a starstruck kid on the, on the island of Maui, just you know hacking away and and sailing some big waves and some amazing things going on. And uh, man, the stories I could tell about that time, you know, the golden age of windsurfing in the '80s and these huge contests. And and here comes you know the Peter Stuyvesant you know deal and descending World Cup three discipline events at Hokipa. Let me tell you, no room on the beach. You wouldn't see the sand up to pavilions, rigs everywhere. The entire beach, you know, was covered. And, you know, it wasn't, it was hoopla and hype. Not everybody loved it, obviously. A lot of people couldn't stand it. And, uh, you know, kind of being a kid going to high school and seeing the other perspective of it, I definitely was fed a lot of perspective from some of my other friends who hated 
the windsurfers, you know, in the contest. The popularity at school, I guess. The fact of being a windsurfer. Not a windsurfer, a wind kook. Wind kook, yeah. And, you know, that's self-evident, right? You know, like that's, it's really cool to see now today. I think, you know, the, the wind kook is, you're still a wind kook, you know, fine. But windsurfing, I feel, has taken a, a turn in terms of the uh, acceptance in, in, in where it was standing back then. As, you know, granted, maybe a kookier sport in a sense. You know, the whole, the whole quantum leap of development was based on a few things, wasn't it? It was based on these parameters of a, of a tour that valued high speed and, 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 you know, being able to sail upwind. The equipment followed. Why were we running these narrow needle-nosed things? after all well they were fast you could do giant backwards what happened to jumping now you know we're riding these minorly thin boards that you can slice around are you seeing you know with the exception of a few people you know the jumping it's 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 all in balance i think people you know in a year like now have had time to think about like where the sport should go you know competitively or otherwise uh i don't really know what i hear in the rumblings of the pwa but you know, I certainly hope that we still see the diversity of Pozo and Maui, with a few things mixed in, because what I will say about back in that golden 80s era was that Maui was, there was two, if not three events there a year. And it upset the balance considerably. There was, you know, slackers like me who made careers out of just being Hokipa sailors, you know. Granted, I did the tour a little bit, but you know, I was one of those guys. Yeah, and uh, and that that served it well. I think you're seeing a lot of the the focus on wave sailing actually is very diverse. There's a lot of places you can do it, like we were saying. Yeah, it is. It is, and it's almost like two worlds, like you say the the windswell world and the and the groundswell world and. You know, the windswell world, probably more about jumping and more about moves, you know, and then the, the groundswell world, more about, you know, speed, power and flow and, and whatever. But we'll get to all that. We'll get to all that. We're in the 80s in Maui. Okay, we're still in the 80s. We're still so I've got the my Oakley blades on. I'm yeah, thinking, I'm thinking about this. So I'm thinking about like Mark Angulo driving his Honda CRX, Oakley blades, Billabong T, and he's like, flying through Maliko Gulch at like 80 miles and he like zooms around and he's doing goose screws and man, the Neil pride team's pretty gnarly. There's like a hundred people on it and Tiga's rolling around, <laughs> you know, fanatics not to be forgotten with their ART cutaway sale. <laughs> Zimmer's in the in the house, you know, Zimmer was such a cool brand to ride for because Malta, you know, had set the course for the radical image that it portrayed. Malta was my hero and, you know, to this day still is because he was just charging these gigantic lips, no hope, just mast and half high under the lip. You know, I wonder if Traversa took a page out of Malta's book, if you even saw that, you know, like that's the idea. If I eat it, I eat it, you know, but I, that moment was you know, good, but you know, you didn't, you saw people starting to connect. I mean, I had some heavy teammates on Simmer. Um, you know, Paul Bryan from neighboring island of Kauai there uh, is the heaviest hitter you would not believe. And these are things you don't see, but I mean, this was later on. This wasn't the 80s. The 80s was the Euros versus the Hawaiians. And, uh, you know, the Simmer team was kind of, you know, stacked with Hawaiians, but we had a couple of the Euros also on there. I mean, we had Anders and Seeger. And, you know, yeah. this was all playing out. You know, you, you would think, yeah, team. Windsurfing's not a team sport in that situation. It's like, you know, you got this, like, complete, like, different agendas working on. Yeah, they're sailing on the same brand. But, you know, it's, it's a World Cupper versus a, a Hukipa guy. And that that took its time to kind of melt over. It doesn't exist today at all. It's interesting. Yeah. But that was kind of the key thing. And, you know, you had that because the people who had the Hukipa titles were, you know, Dave Kalama, Mark Angulo, Paul Cal. You know, these guys, you know, were, were holding it down. And, and, and at that it's point, you're trying to defend because, it. It's true. funny because these are the guys that you're, you, you'd also like to watch, especially Mark and Paul Cal, on video. This is, this is the guys that 
you know and and it seems like nowadays per the the contest guys are not necessarily the the best free sailing guys you know it's somewhere there in that area you know but but it's yeah i don't know um uh, i'm just really interesting like you rock up in i don't know 88 or 86 or whatever you rock up a hokipa on a random day and what do you see you know and who's the standout and just and what's the feeling is the feeling really like okay i'm in the world's windsurfing world's belly button right now i'm like in the middle of the you know because yeah no i mean uh the, it was 87 like the beginning of 87 but what i showed up to maui on the heels of was this monumental 86 aloha classic which was you know double plus mast high rich myers getting eaten you know the, the most monumental wave event at of all time and it was you know what 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 that transferred into uh was the o'neill contest in the spring so what i'm seeing now what i saw when i showed up to maui in 87 was people were starting to do forwards chester ray contagali in the 86 event was running the cheese roll you know kind of splatting it and then in between that time Dave Kalama in a decline ad rolled the first actual sheeted in forward. You know, my friends and I were conceptualizing this. And you know, this decline ad was monumental because it's time like kind of planted. Well, I started, I, I'm sailing Okipa watching Dave Kalama do that in my face. And I'm like, you know, a little bit psyched. My roommate at the time was Maui Meyer. Uh, you know, he was a legend. And uh, he, he and I we were at Sprex one day and, you know, like forced ourselves to start trying it. And I did a couple splats, and I remember he did a perfect one right in front of me. So the forward was happening going into the, the O'Neill, but there were variations of it. And there was guys who were going a little more sideways, and there was guys like Matt Schweitzer and especially Brett Lickle, who were just going like end over end, boom, end over end, like literally end over end forwards. And uh, those were spectacular to watch, especially with those – high aspect rigs everybody was using. yeah it was cool back then wasn't it not so cool anymore <laughs> so that was going on the o'neill contest happened and uh that was a big one because i remember fondly that you know mark angulo got to the top of the single elimination and then here comes ian boyd at 16 years old and double eliminates him and wins it so ian at ian at 16 you know person i went to school with you know won that event it was it was overwhelmingly inspiring for me. It was like just the hugest thing you could have ever watched. It is you know, really emotional in a sense of just like, wow, look what, you know, like happened there. And uh, motivation was so big after that for me personally, uh, you know, to, to, to break through, which, you know, in the eighties, it was, it was not my time yet. Um, I started getting top five, you know, once the nineties hit. That's when, you know, I had found my stride and learned how to compete, you know, not learn how to not let an eight minute heat psych you out. Granted, back then, what did they judge you on? They judged you on wave riding jumps and transitions. So, you know, sit there and whip helicopter tacks and, you know, like, yeah, the contest thing. So, you know, three events a year up to, I think by 91, you had the Hard Rock, the O'Neill and the Aloha Classic. Yeah. And so that, that was a, you know, that, that was a really, uh, a huge era that didn't last too long. And, you know, rightfully so, I think that even the local community just got totally sick of all these contests and, uh, you know, here we are, you know, not being able to do the Aloha this year, but the fact that, you know, for the track record that it's was able to continue, you know, for 10 years. And I think everybody saw the importance of the current PWA tour and otherwise that, you know, it brought some diversity to it. Uh, and you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, I think there's, there's a really good, uh, relationship now in the competitive sense of what Hukipa meant to windsurfing in terms of back then. I think that's kind of translated to now, both in, both in the image of the sport and just competitively. Yeah. Yeah. It's, do you get this feeling like back then, ev like, the importance of these contests, the importance of Hokipa, the importance over the years or, or just, you know, all the brands developing in Hawaii, whether it be racing, wave sailing, whatever it would be, you know, all the R&D being there, etc. That has somehow been a little bit lost over the years, correct? 
Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think that you'll ever see it, you know, completely center of the universe. I, I, I think that what people did was they learned how things are done here and, you know, like transferred that along. I, I think there's been a lot of technology that's been borrowed from what's been developed here. Well, granted, I mean, Maui's gone through all the cycles. I mean, Clark phone blanks. They used to get boards from Craig Masonville at high tech, you know, watch that get done. So, I mean, we saw the whole thing. We saw the sandwich construction and all this stuff. Uh, ideas kind of do bounce around here. It'll always remain a developmental hub uh, in terms of, you know, the actual production or construction. That's a different story. Uh, but what's going to happen, and I think what you've seen in the past too, is that, you know, stuff that gets developed here, you've got to be careful that it's not only going to work here, because Maui is a unique environment to its own and that there is, you know, a certain sense of certain designs that will work here and not everywhere else. And, you know, I must say that, you know, I'm going to plug something, you know, this board right here that we developed the flyway, we made sure that it worked, not just it will keep up. Yeah. And that has a little bit to do with, you know, tuning fins and whatnot. Uh, you know, in terms of stuff where it's going now with foiling and I mean, the unbelievable amount of options that you're presented, you know, with, with what you can do with the wind and the waves. And uh, it's, it's, it's a test. I think it's environmental, you know, depending on where you are, how consistent your environment is. And that's why I think Maui is always going to be on the map because it is certainly got the quantity of sailing, you know, generally speaking, we're seeing it right now. I mean, these last days, all the wind we're getting right now is making up for, you know, the whatever October, you know, they had here and, you know, you notice that that's, you know, the swing of the pendulum. And yeah, I see, you know, everybody down at the Poela Cannery, the guys are working on boards and it's, it's business as usual here. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, so think of the eighties, nineties, you kind of get on tour a little bit, but I, I'm not sure if this is something you want to get, like, like you say, you know, you, you kind of do your Maui thing really well. And then the rest of the tour, it seems like the, the, like you say, the Hawaiians, Josh said it really well, you know, first time he went to Pozo, he was like, is this wave sailing? Like, are these waves? But then, you know, being a competitor, you, he kind of humbled himself a little bit and, you know, yeah. okay, let's try to learn this. And this is just, this is windsurfing as well. This is wave sailing, but it's, mm -hmm. or, or as you call it, this is windsurfing, not wave sailing, but it right, is right. part of it. And it's just something. Oh, yeah totally totally different right and my question is like how far because it is these two worlds and maui is like when i got there um i felt like it was very yeah it's it's sort of it's it's almost not real world you know what i mean it's like i do and it, it feels like everybody kind of feeds into that and once you're there you start feeling that way as well you know well it's it's a really unique environment i mean it's it's got it's got a lot of energy and vibrant you know conditions i think that it you're, you're feeding off of it you kind of mutate it's it, it is environmental i mean i agree with you there uh yeah. it's 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 kind of like it's a career, it's a, it's a life decision, you know, like you see people who you build careers based on results, which will then, you know, legitimize their earnings or, you know, their position in the sport versus clearly people who are only, or not only, but the number one thing they're into it for and count me amongst those is the sailing. And, you know, you're into it for the sailing because you're obsessed with the sport and you want to ride the best gear and you want, you know, to travel if you can or just be in the right place at the right time where you sail. And I think that that, you know, all those requirements there within and above, I mean, you know how important equipment is and, and, and what it can do, you know, to enhance your experience with, with sailing. And, I, and that should be the drive of whatever we're trying to do as a whole. I mean, competitive windsurfing is, like I said, it's not a team sport. It's this individual thing that you're trying to achieve. I, I, I like the team ethic myself. I'm a really team oriented person, but I mean, I've just seen it for too many years where it's, you know, so individualized, but when you're developing, you know, with a team of people in, in, you know, working on, on designs and stuff, that's, that's, you know, much more team oriented. It's much more, 
kind of forward I guess, thing. I guess, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to get at is when you get to Maui, you get this feeling like, uh, well, you guys doing over there in Europe, it's okay, but it's not the real thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, um, I think that's, that's the way people might have used to thinking. And then you look at Thomas Traversa down in, you know, at, you know, Cal Point in France and, and what he's scoring there. Believe me, like everybody's eyes are wide open to what the world has to offer. Uh, conditions wise. And I mean, Maui's got the reputation. Uh, I'll be honest about Maui. It's, it's, it's quantity over quality. A lot of the time, uh, a place like Cape Verde is going to be quality over quantity a lot of the time. And your, your balance of being there, you know, in terms of when it's, you know, really firing is one thing, but all the uh, people are, we're in this era where people are figuring out their environments and you're seeing these sessions go down in places where people have figured it out that this place fires under this you know, environment. We've got enough people windsurfing at a high level worldwide that they're venturing out in some stuff. Where's this place down in Australia? You know, like it's, it's a really never been a better time to be a windsurfer than now in terms of what it can offer you gear wise. And then what's on the map. Cause yeah. I mean, yeah, Google earth will tell you a lot of things. It won't tell you how windy it is right at that moment. I mean, we got windy app or whatever other, you know, millions of tools that consume our lives to forecast every day, you know, like what happened to the old, just look out the window and see a tree move. Right. You know, let's go sailing and look at the water. That's kind of the purity of it. Like I spend enough time, you know, trying to forecast where to be and fly that, you know, like there is kind of a beauty of it. Uh, doing you know your own thing so it, we're not in a time right now where you can travel you know freely so we're really i think there is and has been in the last you know nine months a lot of people discovering their local areas more and that's kind of been the beauty of it i mean i went through the same thing in finland and, and realized that yeah you know like there is no place like home it's it's a little bit more like the same way i appreciate maui you know if i'm not here all the time all the time yeah. So that's. Yeah, I explored Poland and I didn't find anything new, but <laughs> that's beyond the point. Yeah, come up and visit me, man. You're welcome anytime. Yeah, but then, um, but then, when we talk about this this difference between Maui and Europe, we it came up when I interviewed John Sky and he and, and we were talking about this selling as, as for equipment, selling the dream, yeah, versus selling the function you know what i mean and and you being involved with simmer a lot um i wonder what's your take on that being obviously a maui guy um you know all the photo shoots being da done in, in maui and whatever and everybody wants to sail the way you know the way levi brazino whatever right. these guys sail in, in hokipa but your reality and your environment might not be that and then your gear you should choose it accordingly, but at yeah. the same time, you're still dreaming to, you know, I still want to ride like, like Polakau in about time, you know, but <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so what's your take on that? Well, if you're going to use that uh, as an example, look at that era of what boards prioritized and specifically those strapper boards he was riding. What did they do? They, they looked to me to be like reverse fee, low entry rocker, fast boards that had, you know, a snappy tail, a lot of release, but mainly what Polakow's game was about speed. He sailed fast. He bottom turned like a blur and was, was a master of manipulating the pocket still is obviously I sailed with him the other day. Uh, you know, cut forward to what, what got prioritized now. There's a lot of things that led to the way boards are now. And what we're prioritizing more on wave riding is just simple placement uh, and being able to, you know, turn powerfully in a couple different angles. The way I approach it might be different the way, you know, Levi approaches it. Every wave's different here. You know, who keep us a spot that will throw you so many different looks that you want to have a level of adaptation to it that you can kind of take a couple different approaches uh, but what I really find, uh, again, prioritizing in my own game is, is mobility and speed. And that doesn't necessarily have to come with volume. And that's got more to do with efficiency. And, uh, you know, bringing up, uh, you know, free sailing versus, you know, competitive sailing, 
what I remember about when Francisco Goya won his world title, if you want to bring up, you know, arguably the best free sailor who won a world title, <laughs> you know, like that, that became uh, very much part of his game as, you know, an efficient board, but maybe, you know, going small and efficient. Right. I think there's something to be said about that. Uh, what I'm noticing right now, selling Hokipa with under 20 people every day, sometimes as few as 10, is that I'm undersizing some of my rigging decisions to go with a freer feeling rig because I'm not battling a crowd of people. And uh, that's been really refreshing because, uh, you know, the old adage of, you know, you know, go all the way outside with the most mobile rig and then I find, you know, it's sailing overpowered all the time. It's, it's, you know, been a real eye opener to, you know, the freedom I feel on the way face when I'm riding like that. And, yeah. and, you know, efficiency of gear, it's, 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 I think it's, you know, especially me, look, I'm almost 50 years old, man. I, I need the gear that's going to you know, allow me to do a lot of work for me. And uh, that's, that's the goal right now is to make it as enjoyable as possible with as much capability as possible. And the new gear really does that. It is amazing, the stuff we're riding now. Like if you pick up something from, from 20 or even from 10 years ago, it's, it's nowhere near, you know. But what I'm, I, th I guess what I'm trying to ask you is if a guy from a local side onshore beach in Norway comes up to you for, for gear advice and you tell him he needs that fast kind of onshore design, and he'll tell you, yeah, but it's not sexy. You know what I mean? I want to do what, what you guys are doing over there in Maui, you know? And there's this little, yeah, I wonder, I wonder if the, you know, if your, if your onshore design photo shoot shouldn't be in freaking silt, you know, because that's what people actually do with that. You know what I mean? We're, we're kind of selling dreams and it's, and it's amazing because, you know, I grew up watching that, you know, all the VHSs I had were from Maui basically or whatever, but yeah, there is something to be said there for sure. Well, selling the dream, you know, the, 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 the real world board phase or whatever, you know, I, I, I feel the adage has just much more to do with, you know, approaching the conditions appropriately. And, and, and you have to, you will be in a situation where the conditions can be quite marginal, but if you have the right equipment, it's a blast. And, and this, this doesn't, you know, translate into all of a sudden it's sunny and 80 degrees. You know I mean? The reality is you're sailing where you're sailing. You can turn it into the dream with the gear. There's no question, you know, that that is true. And your points, you know, well taken is the gear has become, you know, front row and center. What's actually speaking the language of how we ride and it's enabling everything. And that comes right down to, you know, what fins you're using and how important that is, something that's, you know, overlooked perhaps. And, you know, board, sail, and fin all, you know, in a perfect harmony there. And you've got it in the right situation, the right, you know, I don't care if it's 10-foot Punta Preta or, or half a foot Finland. I'm still having fun. And it, that's kind of the, being able to purvey it. I just feel that, you know, things have definitely gravitated away from this, Hawaii centric focus for the most part. I, I think that there is some levity in it. I think the pictures look the best because of the color. And that's always been the thing. Uh, Simmer is a Maui based brand uh, in terms of its imagery, but it's a worldwide brand. Uh, and that's, that's got to translate as well. So I think you have it right there. I mean, yeah. Speaking of Simmer, 30 years you're involved there. Rider any other shape of for shape or form and i don't think many people know what 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 your actual role there <laughs> is you know so tell us a little bit about that and how and how this came about from going from being a writer to getting involved more on the let's say business side which is yeah maybe a little bit yeah you know um any business that survives has to has to have a plan uh, I've, I've known Thomas Pearson, uh, for a very long time, uh, before he took over, uh, my initial relationships were with the Simmer brothers when I was a writer who had moved to Maui, uh, the license, uh, you know, shifted over, uh, at the beginning of this century, right around then anyway. Uh, you know, I have a lucky uh, coincidence in terms of my background in Finland and that there's a very strong presence of Simmer in Sweden. 
And that is due to my friends at the shop at Surfers Varbear and also uh, Thomas at the time living in Sweden. And so there was a lot uh, going on there. Uh, it's, it's something that's, you know, pretty deeply ingrained. This is far later though. Uh, I basically never found it valuable to, you know, jump ship and shop around for sponsors. Uh, I would certainly say I took less to stay in the same position that I have as a writer. Uh, the business end of things has been a little bit more based on that. Uh, I find a lot of people want what I ride and, um, I, I've probably, you know, started a, a, a small industry just based on my used gear. <laughs> so, you know, like it's, it's, it's translated into that, you know, back when I had ridden for other board sponsors like Quattro for 10 years and stuff that you, you get the ball, ball rolling in the sense before a company goes production. Uh, in Simmer's case, you know, that they decided to start making boards was a really monumental decision. And, you know, it took a little while for it to, to you know, get its groove on. And, you know, the construction, right, and all these things. I have so much respect for all the brands out there that are doing this and, you know, sacrificing what they are to make it work. And I believe in, in my heart that we all do it for the sailing. I do. I mean, uh, I, I think that if you do it for the sailing and the love of the sport, the money will come. If you're only doing it for the money, then you're probably not putting out a product that will maximize your sailing. And that's kind of, you know, the, the very surface of it. But I mean, you know, you got to do it for the love and, 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 and gear wise, I think with Simmer, it's always been about that. I think that the number one thing, uh, you know, even getting into flat water designs and, you know, like trying to transfer into even race sales. I mean, these aren't every, you can't just, you're somebody who does absolutely everything in windsurfing. And I mean, I, I don't think that everybody aspires to that. And uh, I'm certainly trying to take all the boxes uh, and any brand such as an RD or a Nash that tries to do absolutely everything has a lot on their shoulders. And uh, while Simmer has progressively gone into making more and more equipment that, you know, covers all these spaces, they remain a core windsurfing brand. <clears throat> and that's something I'm really proud to be a part of because that's my ethic too. I think everything kind of corners off of around that. And uh, that's, you know, depending again on where you are and where you sail. But it's, it's never been a better time. And, and yeah, I'm super happy with the gear. And I, I, I look around too. I look at all the other brands gear and I'm going, yeah, I have no problem having a high opinion about, you know, some other brands equipment. That's what it's all about. I think we're feeding off of each other at any rate anyway. I mean, we're all on the same team. I like to try and say that even though we're not, but you know, like we kind of are. So, you know, keep pushing. We it's getting better. Because because if we expand windsurfing as a sport, if we make it more fun, if we make it more accessible, if we make it just a better sport, we'll all benefit. You know? Yeah, so it's, kind of, are, it's kind of selfish. Like, I've got this board that's really good. You can't ride it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah, I think it's really, you touched on that with the technology and with everything. I, I, I find it really underrated from the public what a process it actually is to prototype test and produce yeah. equipment you know like you said like the the construction you know like one little thing doesn't add up and it's already a major fuck up and you have to yeah it's 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 overwhelming and you know you never get a second chance to make a first impression and i've certainly you know learned that firsthand uh you know, I mean, I was forced to make a very big decision uh, with the Simmer Board project 10 years ago, and that was leaving Quattro. And, uh, you know, that was that was a big ask at the time. Uh, why? Because, you know, I rode the best boards and, and you know, Keith Tabool watches me sail every day. And I, uh, you know, these are friends of mine that I've been you know, sailing with for 20 years. I do feel like in that particular decision that Possibly everybody who would have been in my position probably would have done what I did. Not everybody, but most, most everybody, uh, you know, but the point is also that, you know, I back to the same ethic of like, you know, we're all here doing the same thing, sort of, we have our different, you know, avenues of how we approach it. 
and it's all good. You know, like I, I make sure that, you know, the, the relationships with the uh, people and the brands that I have written for, you know, stay on the up and up. Now, it, they're, they're, it can be pretty, it can be pretty uh, chippy out there, you know, like, you know, I'm sure you know. <clears throat> Especially and in the I, racing world, I can tell I, you. I was just going to start talking about the racing world, right? Yeah, you know, I, I, I hear you, brother. And, and like, uh, my interest in racing probably lies in the commentary booth, but, uh, you know, like, uh, that's, that's, I, I do watch and uh, I, I learn a lot about, you know, what, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see from the rider perspective and then from like what they're trying to portray to the spectator to make it more interesting and how that's gone through all those differences. I wonder how the Olympics are going to be now with this new equipment. Fascinating. It would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. So when you watch, so when you watch these things, when you watch these events that you're not necessarily so invested in as a, let, let's say that you're invested in from maybe more of a brand point or like, like, what do you actually see? What do you look for? And, and where do you think it's headed? Yeah. I mean, uh, the people who are dominating and, you know, some, some, some eras you have this like singular figure who's just like cleaning up and dominating constantly. It seems like there's a little bit more parody right now at the top. There's, you know, not as much, you know, it, it's not always going to be a certain individual. So uh, in a way that tells me the gear is even more important than ever. Um, I kind of look like, you know, I, I, I like, I like my, my, my purchase, some sort of like, you know, fantasy gambler, like I'm going to put you know money down on this guy and like turn it into a betting thing and really get into it. And, you know, like, and, and what, what is the premonition? I mean, of course it's performance based, but you're looking at you know, something that is akin to a horse race in a sense. And uh, you could, you could bet lots of money on it and have a, you know, lucrative gambling league on, on, on racing. And that would be cool to kind of get into like the dynamics of like you and your rider that you're betting on. Like, you know, you know there's some money to be made there. Right. I wonder how fake take your it. emotions out of it. Bet against your own rider. <laughs> right. Take your rider and, you know, whip him into shape or her into shape and then, you know, take it from there. That's, I, you know, like gambling and, and how it's permeated leagues like the NFL. I mean, why not? Let's, let's gamble on, on, on slalom racing. Yeah, Big buck. Definitely something. I just, I just think like generally sports in the States or in North America in general, we can, as in, PWA is most, let's, let's face it, it's mostly a European-based entity, even though the office and the address is in Hawaii and whatever. But I think we could learn a lot from American sports in terms of that's one thing. Gambling and just fantasy, windsurfing and all that is one yeah. thing. You know? But just the whole um, fanfare with which American sports are run, and it's all about the show. You know, it's only totally. and all about the show. And what's what's at stake? You know, there's this, you know, this is this is what's at stake. This is what's riding on it. And you know, you have that. And I say all this, you know, as a fan of windsurfing, a huge fan. And and you know, I, I do pay attention and I do, you know, have my favorites and 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 then you know that 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 turns into something, right? So I think everyone's like that. You're I'm sure you are, you know. It, it's a little different when you're directly involved in the game. I think, you know. To someone who's you know not a racer looking at it you know that's that's a different that's a different perspective but again i'm pretty sold on the fact that the gear is a really huge part of it too and what's and funny yeah. is is it's really close like you know some stuff performs a little bit better in some conditions and other in others and whatever but if 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 everything's tuned like to the highest level you end up with you end up in a final with eight guys and after a 400 meter reach there's half a board difference you know it's insane if you think about it it's insane how far yeah, that is how far it's come you know it's like like in formula one that you see you know oh this guy just dominated he won by 0.8 of a second right <laughs> <laughs> you know kind of yeah, it's kind of similar. And, and this what's at stake and this kind of all this pathos, I don't know if that's a word in English, but all this, you know, making everything big, you're watching the NBA finals and 
you sure. know, and you feel the guy lost and you feel like you feel for him, you know, and then you realize that oh, the guy's making 40 million a year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? well, you're saying too, you know, based on who's in front of those races uh, is that there is a lot more parity in the racing right now. So it's, it's not anybody's game. I mean, there's the top guys, you being amongst them and like, you know, like, well, it's not like this era that I saw when Dunkerbeck would just be lengths ahead winning all these races. And, uh, you know, that credit to him for all his, his titles, but it almost seemed like nobody had a chance on some of these, yeah. you know, horses and the, and the equipment and whatnot, but somebody that far ahead, we're not seeing that anymore. Yeah. Are we, do you think that that played a lot in the demise of, of competitive windsurfing and the whole circus shrinking quite a little bit? What I think, happened to racing was that there was a specific type of equipment that was being prioritized on certain courses that were staples in this and it and it never changed for a while in the terms of the parameters of what you needed to do to win a race have blistering board speed have blistering board speed a couple jibes you know like it, it it i don't think uh it was as well thought out as it could have been and it certainly favored Dunkerbeck who just cleaned up. I mean, there's, you know, I'm not saying there's no reason the guy was a multiple time world champion, both in, you know, waves and in racing. But I mean, it did, I remember, you know, one of the first people that made noise was Finney and Maynard, you know, finally at one point you know, duct tape on his ear, you know, came and, you know, started winning some races. You know, that, that's, that's, you know, that's tough stuff. I mean, Dunkey's tough as nails. I mean, that's, 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 that's a run of dominance that you just don't see. Yeah. The equipment had something to do with it, but there was also just the X factor of the Terminator, just, you know, holding it down. You got to give him credit. Was it bad for the sport? I don't think we need to go that far. I think that you saw something, you know, in it's absolute peak of peaks that was just untouchable for a while and nothing ever lasts like that unless it reinvents itself constantly. And what, you know, I mean, really, Looking at that era of windsurfing in the early 90s when it was like peaked out and you had you know, all these events and the PBA at the time, you know, the surfing world was looking at windsurfing like, how can we be like that? I mean, I, I always, you know, put surfing on such a huge pedestal in terms of like, you know, what, what the athletes in that sport are able to do and the place of it, you know, the surfing tour back in 91, say when like Slater won his first title, uh, that wasn't much of a tour. They, they put their foot down somewhere around 95, not just for the money and the accolades, you know, and the, and the corporate sponsorship, but for the locations. And you saw that, you know, we're going to G-Land now. We're going to go to these good spots. And we're going to turn this into a good tour. Well, you know, surfing built a model there, but you could tell that they were looking, you know, a little bit at windsurfing. Like, these guys are making big bucks and this is a corporate thing. And I mean, like, I don't think I was realizing it at the time, you know, but what what is that kind of thing when you say you're surfing in europe you could say you're doing like how many different sports right well is it all one big ball of wax now are you you know at core are you a windsurfer who surfs and possibly foils and wings and maybe kites and surfs i don't know you tell me it's 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 certainly uh, a really good time to do all of those things depending where you are right i mean it's just getting better and better yeah yeah i wonder i wonder i wonder like people being being there on you know on on tour at that time when when the sport kind of grew smaller and like where were the guys realizing what was going on and seeing surfing on the rise and and whatever i just wonder like it whether it could actually be stopped or was it just a thing of like okay kiting came along and so many other outdoor activities and possibilities that you know, windsurfing for a while was the only one, you know, was the, pretty much. So, so yeah. It, I, it's, it seems like uh, fairly recently um, some of these barriers have been melted down. Uh, you're not just a, a, you know, a windsurfer or a kiter or, you know, credit, credit Kyle Eddie, credit Rush Randall, credit these guys who did it all. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and, and we're able to, you know, utilize the merits of all of these different sports. I mean, no, look no further than Kyle Lenny, who's, you know, highly proficient at everything and 
has escaped, I think, being categorized. I mean, for a little while there, he was like the stand-up. You know, that was like his main thing. He's he's erased that. He is not being tied to any particular sport. The fondest thing about Kai to me is that he continues to pump windsurfing and windsurfs. And you can see he holds it in a high regard. And what that's done to the public perception of the sport is just awesome. So... You know, that's, and you're seeing it, you know, I have Brazinho at Jaws earlier this year. Insane. You know, guys are, guys are like, you know, from the surfing world, going, Poncho Sullivan does this pose like, this guy's going under the lip on a 20 foot wave. Yeah, you know, he is. <laughs> so we're, we're still wind kooks, right? But you know, like, I think things have, have, have been put in a very rightful place with everything. Yeah, yeah. So you've been um, Wind Cook, Simmer, team captain for a while now. Yeah, I guess I escaped, you know, my role with the company. I just buttered over that one. You know, it's I'm not quite the guy who wasn't invited to the party and won't leave. But like, you know, I'm kind of I'm lingering around in a role that that they gave me. Like once team captain came around, that gave me this, you know, that that extended it sort yeah. of indefinitely, yeah. right? Because, you yeah. know, like, you know, we're not trying to win the Stanley Cup here or anything. Yeah. And, so, you know, quite akin to it, like even, you know, like world titles aside is that, you know, I, I must say that, you know, uh, being team captain, you know, I've dealt with a lot of, you know, really interesting personalities on the team over the years. And it's a really interesting position to be in because of the fact that, you know, competitively speaking, that's not, you know, the, the number one thing that, you know, I'm doing. I'm portraying the brand. I'm a brand ambassador that you know can can talk to anybody anywhere anytime uh you know i'm not trying to be the best in the world i'm trying to show that my the gear i ride is the best in the world that's that's where i'm coming from and 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 the number one thing that that gets that done is going out and sailing and you know talking and showing it up at the beach and you know and that that really goes a long way in a place like maui right now i'll tell you that um you know, thanks to guys like Jimmy Hep and the Fishbowl Diaries and, and any of the number of other lo awesome local photographers here at Eric Aders and everybody living yeah. here. And center, it's still the center of the universe in that sense. And, yeah. you know, uh, we're really blessed to have, you know, the environment we're in here. It's great yeah. to be back in the part of that lineup. And I think that, you know, for Simmer, especially, you know, like, you know being a home Maui brat, it's, 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 it's really, it's reassuring. And I feel yeah. like uh, right now, you know, we can look ahead. You know, there was no Aloha Classic. I feel like we can really look ahead to what the IWT and the PWA together are going to be able to do for wave sailing. And uh, some of these, you know, really interesting exploits of, you know, all these environments that, you know, might on paper, you know, totally seem really attractive. I mean, it's I've always, you know, told Simeon whenever I've spoken to him, the director of the IWT, that, you know, I really felt as much of a symbiotic relationship that can exist there uh, would be a good thing because, you know, I've, we've got up and coming riders on, on Simmer Style that, you know, are facing a decision. Do you want to become a PWA rider or do you want to, you know, run the IWT events or what's that path? And I think for, you know, an up and, up and coming rider that we have on Simmer is Noam Artsy here on Maui. He's a 16 year old kid, reminds me a lot about, you know, who I was at that time. Uh, you know, just full of enthusiasm, loves sailing Hukipa, but also wants to, you know, carve a career path. What's his, what's his, you know, decision right now? Head on down to Pozo and, you know, start getting, getting gritty. And yeah, that's probably part of it if you want to be world champion and rightfully so, but luckily for him, you know, and let's hope that Hukipa holds that, you know, allure and mystique too. And that's kind of as a brand with Simmer investing in Nuam, we're looking at that, you know, importantly that Maui is a part of Simmer's image. And, you know, my ties to it, I think right now, uh, I probably spend under half a year here. Less. So, you know, it's, it's good. Yeah. You, know, you know, hand the torch to the local kid, you know, in that sense, yeah, my role is always going to be, you know, representing the brand. I have all these different pockets around the world that I am able to do that. So that's, yeah, that's kind yeah, of, hopefully, hopefully that path, like you say, is going to be unified in that, you know, like you say, there, there's going to be a, where I think we're right now too small of a sport to, to, to divide it further, you know, but I totally agree. Yes. Yes. Um, foremost. My question exactly. is as a, as a team captain, and you spoke about slalom and watching that and, 
And Robbie Nash said if, if the level of stoke, of sharing the stoke could be quantified, that's what he would sponsor guys by, you know, categorize guys by, let's say, or rank guys. What is your, some of your, some of the things you look at when you want to sponsor a guy or a guy writes you a sponsorship request or that's that's a great question i'm really glad you asked that and you you have you know people who are in it for a lot of different reasons and we here at simmer style look for people who love windsurfing first and foremost above everything else that's the root of it all man you know Somebody who goes out no matter how big, small, cold, warm, junky, rainy, just goes out. It's the root of it all. Granted, you know somebody who knows their limits too, but yeah, you want, you want somebody who loves what they do. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. And, and you know, the, the, the finer things come shining through after that. You know, competitive sailing, it doesn't always bring the best things out in us. <laughs> You know, it's, you, you know it well, my check and, and, and I've seen it and, and, and I understand that that's what competition is. Right. But at the same time, you know, who's the guys, the best competitor is it sometimes the guys having the most fun. So, you know, you want to breed that early on. Um, confidence is an important thing to have in that environment. And, and I can see how, how that, can break, you know, somebody who's not confident down. But, you know, we Simmer, as a brand, I think uh, we have people on both tours, IWT and PWA. Uh, I think recently there was more of an emphasis on, uh, you know, uh, a few riders who were on the PWA uh, with the brand. We kind of, you know, looked at that as what the value of that was to the brand to us specifically just based on being a maui based brand image wise and otherwise you know at the spiritual home of the brand and so what what did that tell us that you know like what would it mean if one of our writers won the pwa title you know what i mean like is that is that does that then finally legitimize us as a brand and you know i took a long hard look at that and i just kind of went we're kind of already had the hard work done we've been around long enough that that you know that that part of it's done you know you're not you're not going to be further legitimized by anything i mean it was paul bryan won the o'neill and that was the first simmer rider to win a hokipo event and that seemed like that was you know something that malta had been trying to do certainly mark and myself had been trying to do and uh paul was the first to do it in 94 luckily and you know that was that was kind of like okay that's our big goal we want to win a hokipo you know world title is something else granted we want to be the best brand out there we're going to prove it on the level of the highest stage and and win a world title but i also think that the general public sides with me on it all being about the sailing and so you know like you can you can look at it that way and we're we're all out there to have fun and and make the most of that so you know competition is definitely important but i don't think it all of a sudden legitimizes a brand because there's a world title under there just my two cents so you rather look at guys individually it's not like you want to have like you said a team that we talked before like like back in the day and okay this is our pwa guy this is our iwt guy and this is our getting the clips guy or this is our you know go around in his van around europe and promote guy i guess the current mode we're in right now is that we feel that uh there's a lot to be said just for visibility in all the markets, in all the sailing environments, and not an overemphasis of competition. So that has to be a part of it. And so what you say is, what you say is the ideal. You want to have you know strong representation in all those corners. It's just that if you overemphasize one of those corners, be it you know the PWA or or you know otherwise, then you're then you're kind of like, I don't know, you you might be spreading yourself too thin in other areas. Yeah. I said guy. I was supposed to say guy or girl. I got some slack for saying guy, meaning, you know, a person. A person. Well, you know, we, 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 we definitely uh, had a very, very strong female contingent, you know, recently. I miss Justinia and Sarah a lot on the team, uh, you know, but we, we've got Sarah Hilder who's, who's shredding up in the UK. There's going to be some up and coming other names and faces. It, it, it will cycle itself. Uh, that's probably one of the things I'm proudest most, I must say, about Simmer is 
uh, you know, the, the length of time on the team and my involvement aside, some really amazing people have ridden for this brand, you know, over the years. And uh, I like to take this opportunity, not by name, just thank everybody out there who's ever been a part of the Simmer team one way or the other for riding with us. And, you know, that's a long, long list of people. It's a good thing. And a long list of, and a long list of stamps in your passport as well for, for those probably what, like 30 years now. Um, do you, you have, know what? do you have a list, like a list of your top five waves or your top five wanted, I want to go there places or give me, give me your top five waves. Um, okay, but let's start with where I've been and where I want to go. Those are two different lists. Yeah. So how about we'll start with where I want to go. Okay. <laughs> okay, we'll start with that. Um, I would really like to sail Cloud Break. Me too. Amazing. Looks amazing. Yeah. Looks so perfect. Yeah. I, I, you know, I'm a goofy fit surfer. I'm not going to say that, you know, I am a strong, goofy uh, Portax sailor but that has helped me and I'm ready to take that one on. I'd love to go. Jason Polakow, sign me up. All right. So, you know, like there's that, um, right next door in new Caledonia. And this is something I learned uh, a lot about from Sarah Hauser was a place called Tenya. I want to sail that wave really badly too. I really want to go to new Caledonia and sell that spot. Uh, let's go further over to West Oz in the Northern desert there. I won't name it names. Okay. You've named names. Yes. So let's, you know, say, you know, what you're seeing here actually is that uh, there's a lot of port tax spots on my list. I might've satisfied my desire for most of the down the line starboard wave ceiling that's out there. But what you'll find is on the other list are, are those spots. So let me see here. Um, Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I I'll, I'll keep it right there. I haven't been to Cape Town. I like to go to Cape Town sometime. That's a windsurfing hub, you know. Maybe a little bit more windsurfing than wave sailing until you get some of the other points happening. But yeah, you know, throw me throw me a little trip there. That'd be that'd be brilliant. And um, I think that that that's pretty. You know, it's 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 a good mix of northern and summer, southern oh, it's hemisphere. It's all port tack. It's all port tack. Uh, you got Cape Town Sport Tech too. You're right. Yeah. So yeah, I think that the oh, and then you know Indo, and uh, you could go to Nine Thousand Islands in Indo, but specifically on uh, on Java, there's a spot that uh, has been uncorked that I'm super keen on. Yeah. There's got to be some. Probably, so. probably another one to go with Traversa. Uh, you know, camp out in the jungle for two weeks, collect rainwater, and barely survive, and then score perfect waves. But yeah, that's you know that I think the list of places to go. That's they're all Port Tack and for a reason. So there you go. That's that. And you know the top five list of of just you know spots. Um, you know, you can, you can sign me up at Cabo Verde for Alibaba, Punta Preta, and any of the other spots that are on that, on that island and other islands. That's pretty much number one, um, tied with Maui. I think, you know, they, they go along great together. They are unfortunately far away from one another and they require some intricate timing. And as I speak, actually, the Atlantic is firing up. So Josh, if you're listening, get your stuff ready because it's about to get good. And I'm, that doesn't make me shake in my boots. I think that's, you know, kind of one of those things that between Maui and Cabo Verde, you're in great shape. Um, I can't really say that uh, I would necessarily want to put the Canaries on this list, but it is kind of unutilized for me. There's a lot more to the Canaries than just Pozo, obviously. So I need to go visit there as well. I think that's going to have to end up on the list. That's kind of an un, unutilized. And I haven't sailed Clit Miller yet for some odd reason. So I need to go there. And you tick off all the other boxes, but I mean, like, these are like dream destination type of questions. So, you know, part of these, part of these are answers that I can't give you. They're secret spots. So, you know, I'm just throwing the smoke screen on you with clit miller yeah, you're, just me, you're just giving me like a list of like yeah 
Like that was a bunch of crap right there. That answer. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> we'll get some sessions, Vachek. I know you're ready. You know, off, we'll go off the record on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you slide there then. Thank you. I dodged that one not so well. Big waves then. Like you, it seems like I've been, a Mau- I've been to Maui a month watching and it seems like the bigger it is, the better you ride. And a lot of it, and I think a lot of it people don't see is actually about, is it, is it fair to say that the bigger it gets, the more it is about knowledge, experience, and seeing the lineup rather than just skill on the wave? You know, is that, is that a fair assumption? I think you're only, you're, you're touching on part of it for me personally. Yes. The knowledge and experience, that's what you're relying on in the back of your mind. But I actually just really like sailing scared. (laughs) And, uh, there's something about it, man. It's, 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 it's a mental hurdle. I'm in a really interesting place, uh, with big wave riding because of the fact that I have ridden really big waves up at Piahi and a couple times in Cabo Verde as well. And really the only thing left to do there is to catch a bigger one. I'm not saying it's not fun, but I'm my, my, the bar is pretty high here. And you know, if I, if I walked away, I would be fine. And, and I, I, I'm facing that right now is that, you know, it's, it's not worth it to die for some wall of water. You know, and it, it's 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 romanticized and, and celebrated and all of the above. And, you know, that that trophy already exists for me. So I, I'm really measured in terms of risk management when it comes to that. And uh, I, I am in a different mindset than I was when I was 25 with it, for sure. The experience is really important because that keeps you from hesitating because if you let fear, like I say, I like sailing scared, but fear isn't something that you, 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 uh, you can't let it take over, huh? Like there's a healthy amount of fear, I think. Correct. Correct. Because really fear will make you hesitate. And if you hesitate, your worst fears will come true. And you know, that's, that's what you have to avoid. And, uh, It takes a lot of it. The experience is what will calm you down because you're not in unknown territory until you're in unknown territory. And that's really what I manage. It's, it's, it's an interesting process. Um, Back when I lived uh, down in Haiku Makai, down next to Hana Highway on a day with big surf, the ground shakes there. You're next to Maliko Gulch. So you wake up at 5.30 in the morning and the ground... don't believe me, but I swear I felt it. (laughs) Yeah, no, listen, the ground shakes. You know, there's been certain instances. uh, I I remember one swell in particular, some 40, 50 foot swell. And at a certain tide cycle, it must have been high tide. You know, legitimate, like 50 footers were slamming into the cliffs in Haiku. And one particular clasp occurred which sounded like a bomb went off literally like just it was just my friend joe calls me up who lived you know up oily road and did you hear that I'm like yeah and it was just like you, you the the power of the ocean and the amount of energy i mean it's just you you surrender to the fact that you're doing anything you're not taming anything you're not conquering anything you're going out there and you're getting a little piece of it and you're yeah. getting a month for a little bit, and you're getting out of there, and you're going home, and you're coming back. Yeah, and there's something, something really beautiful about fee- feeling so small and feeling that, that nature. That's, that's it. You know, that kind of relates in a way to what I like to do up there in the Lofoten Islands, windsurfing in Tongstad Fjord with my friend Tommy. So, you know, you're under this gigantic mountain that just puts you in that position. It's nice and stationary. It's not breaking down underneath. It's just sitting there. It's not a breaking, moving wall of water. It's this beautiful mountain. And uh, uh, I think that's kind of a balance of of scale and perspective. Yeah, make yourself feel small and humble. 
yeah. very good thing to do. I, th I think what's what goes unwritten about big waves is like how how tricky it gets in terms of wind. You know, we're trying to windsurf it, and and that day um, in 2018, I think it was in 2018 that the contest was there and they called it off because it was too big and you guys were out there and I was out in, in, in Kanaha, um, getting destroyed. <laughs> and it was, it was about seven knots of wind, seven, nine knots of wind. I think I heard and you're probably going to confirm or deny that, that KP actually told Jason Polakow into a wave because it was so light with his windsurfer. <laughs> yeah, that could have that could have gone a little better um, at that point. Um, I think that uh, in the lineup that day it was Derek Darner uh, driving Kyle Lenny, and uh, you know, resorting to towing somebody in in that situation, you want to you know do it really safely. There was maybe a, a, a situation where where KP had chosen a wave that actually Patrick McLaughlin was kiting on and forced. Patry to kick out in a really bad spot. But anyway, yes, that is true what happened. And, and, you, uh, and you know, you don't know, count that one, Matt Check. You know, that doesn't count. He didn't catch it with his own two hands. But Jason rode a really big wave and got towed in. And Jason needs no introduction. He's one of the best sailors out there. But in that particular instance, there was an assist. And that happened earlier on in the session because it hadn't gotten that windy. But I also think that uh, Jason didn't have a big enough sail was the main problem. Neither did Kevin. Uh, I was on a 5-3, and Camille was uh, on a 4-2, which is his version of a 5-3. And, and I remember vividly just, you know, taking Camille on the ski out the back, just going, look, you know, we'll put you in position, see if you can, you know, get the apparent wind to catch the wave. Well, you know, meanwhile, I'm watching Kyle Lenny pull into these giant barrels, and the whole thing was just rather overwhelming, to be honest. Uh, you know, the, the entire cliff of the WSL show lining up and, and, and the whole hoopla behind it and just the moment itself. They had canceled a certain, you know, a big wave event due to the conditions. And, you know, things change over time, you know, like a little 20 minute, half hour, 30 minute hour and the whole place transformed. And uh, that swell in particular was, you know, well, well over four and a half meter at 19, 20 second periods. There were huge, huge troughs being formed. The, the, the swell period was allowing the shoaling of these waves. They would just grow and grow and grow. Definitely the biggest day I've ever sailed there. And when I made the conscious decision to rig, you know, it had been after Camille had, you know, shown that he could at least schlog, which meant the ultimate game of cat and mouse that you have ever played. Because you are only going to go for the bombs. There's nothing else to do. You got to be, you know, right out there in the zone and, and, and play that. I caught two big waves. Rudy Castorina caught two huge waves. And Camille, as we know, got what, you know, many consider the biggest wave ridden out there. One of them for sure. Yeah. And this is what I'm getting at, that the scary part uh, is not actually riding the wave. The scary part is being in the right place, at the right time or not being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like you say, you have to go for the bombs because the small ones or the mid ones, you know, you're just going to get too far in and then the big ones are going to eat you without even riding them. And you have to ride I think big. it goes, you know, nobody actually talks about it. This is, I don't know, for me, that was the, by far the scariest part of, you know, and the following day that I was out there was half the size. And a lot windier, a lot easier. Still, it was fucking scary, man. It's that scary. positioning and, and yeah, all yeah. that is just scary, you know. Listen, uh, that 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 wave in particular draws on you because what happens, my check, you 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 get on, and the groats, it does nothing but just sits there and stands up on you. It's so super unique, and it's very 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 dramatic. Uh, I mean, uh, it, you've gotten a piece out there, which is, you know, great to see. And I mean, especially coming, you know, originating from your environment, you know, the balance of contrasts there. But yeah, it's scary uh, to me. You know, the, the fear and the managing the fear, you know, you don't want to you don't want to put yourself to be scared because, you know, you're in over your head or anything. I mean, the preparation 
will allay the fear. I mean, it, you're, you're still going to be in, you know, a, a state of, you know, enhanced alertness, so to speak, but like, okay, you know, you manage that part for me, you know, going up there and, and or just sailing big waves in general, it's not the, like, I don't call it fun until I'm on my way home, you know, reflecting. Cause when you're in the moment, you're managing, you're managing the adrenaline. I mean, you, you've got me right now, man. You, I'm coming back to the problem that I had after that session, if I may, you know, share with you. I couldn't sleep for a while. I was a mess of adrenaline. I couldn't stop, like, amping out and just, you know, just thinking about just freeze frame moments of, like, you know, I might have looked behind me and watched the lip just, and this is going to be with me for the rest of my life. I'm going to be able to go to this place and like think about that moment and just get right back to how that felt. And it's yeah. rewarding and it's scary and it's memorable at the same time. You know, you make the decision to do it. I'm not some victim of my own, you know, distraction and find myself out there by accident. It's very deliberate, but that's the other part about it is that, you know, I know exactly what I'm getting into. And, uh, you know, luckily or not luckily, my first time I ever sailed jaws, I nearly had a two way fold down. I got destroyed and uh, that's on the radical attitude video. If you ever saw that one, that's a tape. That's a tape for your collection. That's one of the original ones you need to have, but yeah. And uh, you, you know, you go, do, do you think I always wonder? It helps. It helps. It helps. 100% it helps. So many Cause the threshold just died. expanded. You went through the worst possible case scenario. Now you go sail mass tie. keep like it's nothing. Yeah. So there's. That. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Big way. It's such a. I don't know. It's like I get chicken skin even talking about it. You know. It's, I, I want to. I want to talk about what Traversa just did, and again, keep huge amounts of praise and credit to Toma Traversa for his achievement at Nazare. And it's not the first time it's been sailed. Jason Polak went out there with double jet ski assist and did really well. But yeah, Toma, Jason's, Jason's session was kind of on shorey and I don't know. Was it the same situation? I mean, no. I really put them pretty closely together in terms of the chaos that Nazare really seems to be to me. Um, I might really not be opting for that one. It looks pretty much like a little bit like of a category where the punishment outweighs the reward. But listen. You know, like it's, I think with Nazare, it's more clear cut that you're going to get beat at a place like Jaws, you know, you should be willing, listen, if you're going to go sail big waves and you're looking at a lineup, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, are you willing to take the maximum amount of punishment that is being offered to you? You don't go out there doing, I'm going to avoid trouble and I'm just going to go get a little one and come in because that's when your worst case scenario hits you. And, and that's the law of it. You that's when to, you jibe out and you see the big set feathering. Right. That's yeah, like, oh, dun, 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 dun. And it's like clockwork, my check. That is what happens. It's not like maybe, maybe not. No, that's what happens every single time. And, it, it, and in the history of big wave riding with windsurfing, if I may dive into it a little bit, with the, you know, yes, a lot of this is, you know, Jaws related, but we had some historical rides back in 84, Fred Haywood, the Arnaud de Rone shots, gigantic, who closed out, who keep a survival line and, you know, squirts out and he makes it. And then Brett Lickle's Thanksgiving wave of 87, which I saw firsthand was even bigger. That was, that was a situation where that was the heaviest situation I've ever seen anybody, you know, deal with who keep up in terms of the hour and something that it took him to get out and then actually go and decide to turn around and catch a wave, which there were bigger ones coming in, but this is like wash out 20 foot who keep up. The chops going up the face were bigger than anything that happens in the gorge. I mean, it was just like this absolute chaos. And you know, the, once the, once, once we started sailing jaws, you know, that bar kept getting pushed, you know, in all different directions, uh, and, and that session that you spoke about was certainly, you know, one of those one sessions that, you know, really hit a certain level. There's been, you know, Levi Cyber got this giant bomb back in year 2006. That was a monumental one. 
uh, I believe December 99 was this day that got really huge Seeger, you know, but what I think has happened recently, and I'm going to give Tomah a lot of credit for this is that the hunt for those waves is going worldwide. And you know, what's, what's this in Australia, Pedra Branca, Punta, whatever, uh, you know, maybe they don't want me to name it, but there's a place in Oz or Tasmania or something that is just off the, it's incredible. And it might, you know, it might legitimately be the biggest wave in the world. We don't know. Uh, we're we're going to find out. And, you know, windsurfing in the proper conditions is a really good way to ride big waves because you have the ability to sniff out what those ground swells are doing a fair bit in advance and plot your line, you know, to get through and, and yeah, successfully you can use ride the wave. big canvas, right? You, you, it's a big canvas. Granted, it's also a great way to put yourself in even more trouble. You know, you, 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 you can do this and, uh, and the false sense of security that windsurfing can give you, you have to, you have to balance that out with a healthy dose of surfing. You know, you gotta go paddle out and get pounded. You gotta, you know, blow drops and just take a couple on the head every now and then and, 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 and pay your dues, you know? So that's, that's the big wave riding quest. You know, there's less room for error, huh? You know, like you're dealing with with forces and things where you know the second chance, and sometimes it's just it's not there. And meanwhile, you know, a guy like Toma Traverse, who looks like he's got nine lives, is just dancing around these like ridiculous waves and walls of water. I mean, and you know, and others, but I mean, specifically Toma right now is like on a tear. That he goes rarely... out, he goes out, and he's like, I'm gonna hit the lip. Like yeah. no matter how big it is, he just tries to go at it, and I and he's like. Ah, uh, it's not really skill. It's just commitment. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, it's so much skill. You know, the timing, the Jesus. I mean, it's it's insane. Some of the stuff. But you're looking at so you're looking at somebody who who is at the you know the top of his game, and is also very in tune with his equipment. And there's a third element of of it's you know it's managing fear. Um, he's not scared and, and he sees things in, in a way that, you know, you would draw in your notebook. It's like cartoon stuff going on. And I, I, he's going for that. You know, I think he sees in his own mind, like this is possible. I can hook a turn under the lip going upside down and pull it. I mean, I've seen, you know, and, and no, you know, he's, he's a small guy who can ride small gear. And I, I saw this firsthand again with Sarah Hauser and this tiny equipment that she could ride and the positions in the wave that, you know, she was able to do. And then Toma does the same thing. He's able to put this small board that he's able to ride in radical positions and, and effectively just defy logic with the positioning. And that's, that's where this game is now. It's not just like, oh, you rode a big wave you know, happy guy in the channel. No, you ripped a giant wave to pieces. You know, I the bar, the bar I, is really the only knock on, 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 on big wave riding. Like, ah, you guys are not, you know, not going critical or, or whatever. Right. Now you see Brazilian under the lip. Right. On a barreling wave at Jaws and you see Tomah hitting it and just sheeting in for the biggest aerial you've, you ever see or whatever it yeah. is. Uh, when surfing's it's not going see. anywhere it's 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 at the forefront of what you know you can do and it's part of the program and that program man is 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 expanding but it's yeah. it seems to me that there are these root sports that you can base your program around and windsurfing's one of them surfing's the other one and you know that that really seems to me like like where it's at you know in a place like maui or or, or whatnot but you know, hopefully this can all come to normal. I, I miss sailing with a guy like Toma, and I'm sure Toma misses, you know, coming here. This environment suits him really well. He's a great keep a sailor, great jaw sailor, and, you know, any of the other spots that you can come out here and sail. So, you know, it's it's been an interesting time, you know, no competition, but look at, look what comes shining through these, you know, landmark performances of people who are sending it, you know, and really, really, you know, understanding that, that we live in a time where this is instantaneous, that the mag's not coming out in three months, the clip's coming out tonight, and you're going to see it, and everybody's going to be talking about it, and, you know, it's going to set the tone for whatever else, you know, it's cool, and, yeah. and, and fans like this, of the sport, like me and you, sit and watch and talk about it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What a life. 
Um, let's settle a couple things here because this, this has been around and it's never been kind of confirmed or never been really said. And you're a pretty good historian, so I'm going to pick on that a little bit. All right. Who actually windsurfed Jaws first? Because a lot of Who people claim it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I have your answer. All right. Okay. So the first people who windsurfed Jaws was Mark Pedersen, Dave Kalama, and Brett Lickle. And this happened in 19, I'm tempted to say 1990 or something. And they sailed up from Hokipa. And it was not huge, but it was breaking. And uh, apparently Hedgy or one of, one of somebody's rig got stuck in the lip and went over the falls, but didn't break. And then they sailed home. That was the first session at Jaws uh, by definition. It wasn't really Jaws, maybe it was a little bit more like gums, but you know, Piahi. Okay, so fast forward to 1993, and the spring of 93 was very memorable, a very, very huge amount of big swells late in the season. And right around early April, there was a two day, you know, warning level swell. And, you know, this had been kind of, you know, talked about, there was no real jet ski support in existence yet. It had been paddled maybe a few times, but not that successfully. Zodiac and, support. <laughs> they told you know, themselves and, those zodiacs. <laughs> well, let's just break it down. There was no support, but the the first the first day out of these two days, we did have our good friend Greg Aguera and Alex Aguera who had a boat, and I was looking at Hukipa, you know, coming close to closing out, and I was talking to Josh, and I was like, "Man, you guys should go up there. This is it. This is your this. It's not going to be you know too big where you know you know." Da, 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 da. Well. I kind of ended up sailing Hokipa for some reason. And Josh went up with Greg Aguera. Alex Aguera drove the boat, but I think his wife was pregnant and he, Carla was pregnant. So Alex didn't get to sail. He had to, you know, be alive. So Greg goes out, Josh goes out. Uh, I think Greg found himself in trouble in the pit somehow. And Josh got a really famous wave, this barrel with his hand off the boom, just like, and there is this just, you know, monolithic ride. That's in radical attitude also. Yeah. And then the next day, um, we all sailed it. We walked down the cliff. It was me, Mark, Kalama, Rush, Alex, and Brett. And, uh, we just, you know, Mark was the first one to launch off the boulders, barely made it, showed that it was possible. Next thing we know, Mark's in the pit getting, you know, lifted by the set and he has, he's like tying his boom on, but he didn't sail far out enough. And all of a sudden he's getting lifted by the set and we all sail it. And that's when I had my near two wave hold down. I got beat down. The plan was to sail down to Hukipa and uh, that worked for everybody but me. And uh, I had, I'd gotten a couple of really nice waves. I'd, great session but I totally misjudged this one situation and ended up in the pit and had to you know in front of like a 20 foot wave you know pump and then dove off what I remember the most was kind of like being underwater and then you know underwater you hear when it's the second wave breaking while you're underwater looming down on you so it's a near two wave hold down situation kind of a decision am I coming up for air or am I staying down uh, air you know, come up, air, you know, foam about this thick on the surface, you know, throwing it out, get your breath nailed by an 18 foot ball of white water and swam in with my board in pieces over the boulders. I was white as a ghost, scariest thing ever. And that, that's it. That's the answer to your question. Those three sessions right there were, you know, your inaugural days. So this is right around 90, 91. What were the disputes? Was somebody claiming something else? I'd like to hear it. Yeah. There was in, in, in some beer conversations, I've heard, you know, a lot of different, 
this was well, the guy or that was the guy or <laughs> I, even heard, I was the guy you know from somebody which i'm not gonna shame so oh man okay well i don't know you know yeah that my my version of that i think is 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 the uh is the one i don't remember it, it being any earlier than that so yeah, yeah we're not gonna i'm not i'm not yeah i think okay all right all right quite a reliable okay. source let's settle something else you're okay. like a world record speed drummer or something like that <laughs> i like my metal but is there like is there really like a world record for the amount of you know hits you can do in a minute or something or is that just blown out of proportion you just drum really fast and that's it no no i drum really fast that's it but i did win the world's fastest drummer title and this was an organized competition that took place at the nam trade show in la they have it in the third weekend in january it's the entire music industry and so they get every you know this they have a thing called a drumometer which is a drum speedometer and it measures the hits you can't do a, a marching buzz roll it has to be single hits so 907 in 60 seconds baby number one and it's not a world record but it won for the year and i won like all the swag dude i won all these sticks and you know signature sticks and heads and a drum kit and yeah, bro, that, that, that was the real deal. Sick. Yeah, there's some, <laughs> some hand-eye coordination for you on that one. Yeah, you know, that's why I like the metal drumming is you're using your feet and your hands. Uh, a great way to stay busy with the left and the right side of your brain. But, uh, you know, the, the speed drumming, it's, it's, it's not the only type of drumming I like. You sit me down and I'd love to groove with, you know. The any feet of part throws me off. Like I can probably get a rhythm with my with my arms, but then once the feet come in, yeah. it's just like next level shit. So hard. Half of the bands that where my favorite drummers are from are from Poland. Yeah, a lot of metal. A lot There's of There's a lot of really good metal. They come up to Finland and play all the festivals, so I see them. Yeah. yeah, but I mean uh the the you know, it's almost like sport drumming at that level. And you know, I, I consider myself a musician, so you draw the line, kind of, kind of like windswell and groundswell. Like, are you a musician or are you a sport drummer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like to be more of a musician. Let's settle one more thing. If yeah. PWA were to offer you a full-time commentating gig, um, you know, with Ben Profit as our dream duo would you take it <laughs> i would take it uh i would take it with the understanding that uh what you would find my dynamic with the awesome ben profit machine is is really you know the potential there with a motor mouth like myself is just two people running over each other and I, ben and i you know in the same room is a lot for a lot of people but we have a good time we're on the same team he's an awesome teammate and uh an awesome commentator but you know it's his gig so if you know you hire me full time and i'm not coming in here to establish anything you know and i'm going to probably be a bit different than i would be at you know the aloha classic where i'm kind of you know holding the chair so to speak with funk and a couple other guys you know like it's it would be me a mellower version of myself up to a point but i think it could work uh you know the wsl pans into different people it's not just one guy then then i've seen you know do great work at times it seems like it's a little much just being up there alone you know that's a lot of work i mean it, 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 if he manages to even convince himself to compete on top of that it's absolutely overwhelming to sit there and call an event and then go out and sell heat believe me it's yeah. it, overwhelming yeah, yeah I, 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 I sat in for him to call his silt heat and it was like the hardest thing ever. And then you yeah. listen back to it and you're like, oh, I'm flat. I'm so flat, you know, like he pulls, he puts both of you guys, you put so much emotion somehow controlling it, you know, where you know where it's, where you have to build the, I, I always wonder, ask Ben if that's a conscious thing or not. And he says, like, yeah, it's kind of half, half conscious. 
you know, and I think the dynamic would be amazing. Like the, the Brit and the American, you know, <laughs> like you have, you know, like when the Aloha Classic is on, you have two, two team, two camps, you know, you have like yeah, team, yeah. team Kai is amazing and team like bring back Ben because Kai is so American. You know, and, and right. No, no, I, 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 I don't take that wrong. You know, like I think I, I'm, I'm at a stage right now where, you know, you're going to get the real me and, and it's not everybody, you know, can handle that. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the other thing is that, you know, again, it's Ben's gig. So like I would never, ever want it to be a situation where, you know, I took away from that. I only want to, you know, build the build the brand. But right now, you know, you see the hat I'm wearing here. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, my allegiance right now is is with the IWT, uh, based on the fact that uh, you know we're going to get off the ground with a really big tour too. So, you know, maybe we just started a big bidding war. I don't know, but uh, you know, it, the dynamic. Uh, listen, it's not like I can't call a PWA event. We're not. We're 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 like I said, trying to work together here. So that's I think what the forces at play would be is really you know I would be coming in as kind of the IWT guy and Ben's the PWA guy and if the PWA wants to add me to their roster well we're we're open for negotiation it's November it's that time of year man we're talking about next year already right yeah. no you know I, I could be that guy like I remember I won't name names but like there was a guy who was once sponsored by like two clothing companies at the same time and had both logos on his board. And then like the dudes from the company came to the beach and like, Hey, you're sponsoring. Oh no. Hey, you're sponsoring. Whoa. What's going on? Like this triangle, you know, conflict happened. That's amazing. You have to spill the beans <laughs> to who that was. dude. Amazing. Listen, wow. whoever that was, collected two paychecks for a little while and then he collected no paychecks <laughs> for a longer while yeah anyway you know you got you got to be streetwise in this game I, I i i'll elaborate i mean like you know depending on who you're riding for you know that's that's the gear you're slinging right you sling gear don't tell me you don't sling you sling in gear if you're a pro instructor you're slinging gear so you got to ride for a brand that people want the gear you got a bunch of gear for sale that nobody wants, then you don't got nothing, man. Just my two cents. Definitely. Like, like you said, you launched that little used gear corporation of yours you mentioned. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's thriving, believe me. Uh, I'll, we could start the bidding war for this if you want. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Yeah, not in the position. What, what, what are you going to do if you buy my check? You're going to paint it white and just put different logos on it. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I can go there. I think people have been doing it with our boards. I'm just kidding. We don't want to go there. We're keeping this. has been remarkably cordial, but, uh, you know, it's good. I think you, you, you touched on that one thing, you know, with there are different factions in there of people, you know, who like maybe that whole Euros versus the uh, Hawaiians isn't alive, but, you know, maybe it's kind of gotten compartmentalized into more of like countries. Because, I mean, I'm sure like, Listen, man, if you're in a heat with a bunch of, you know, Frenchies or Germans, you know, you know, it kind of gets that way, right? They're going to, I mean, it's not like teamwork in a small um, heat. Well, or is there, do you guys block like that based on countries? There's, no. claims. There's claims, you know, like in the, in the wow. 2016 title race, there was a big claim that the point seven that. team was blocking Pierre, you know, and whatever. Okay, right, but that. that, so that's going to that's gonna affect my betting. You know, when you talk about betting, then you can start fixing races. You pay off a couple guys to block dudes, and then you know, hey. you got to get the insight. You know, you got to get the insight. Uh, you know. Bookie, maybe you should become the prime windsurfing bookie. You know, yeah, I could do that. Probably, you know, have my have my you know little undercoat hustle, there. Hustle guys into betting big on something ridiculous or whatever. You know, what, what do you mean? I, I already do. <laughs> okay we have this section that we that we go to at the end all right um, which was supposed to be quick fire questions when i kind of designed it but it ended oh up watch out with me dude i'm gonna spend an hour on each one being very it ended up being very very slow fire <laughs> so number one what are your pet peeves pet peeves you know talking behind people's back gossip little small town 
preferably you can't say something to my face, but you can talk behind my back. Happens a lot on this island. Definitely. <laughs> How many times a day do you pee or wet? Ah, shit, that doesn't ah, actually it does. Well, uh, how many times did I pee my wetsuit? Were you gonna say? Yeah. Well, you know, up in Norway, you know, quite a lot. Two times. Always before a duck dive, though. Doesn't run up. <laughs> then you flash it. No, out no, I, I use old wetsuits. There's holes everywhere. Yeah. So you're the rubber. Not the, the, the stretching yeah, yeah. you like the rubber. Yeah, no, no, yeah. What is your guilty pleasure? My guilty pleasure? Well, I'll tell you, you know, I have this chocolate mousse that I buy at Mana Foods that I'm not always allowed to, you know, it's not always, but I have it now. And like, even this time of day early in the morning, like sometimes I reach for it and I really shouldn't do that. Amazing. Mana's chocolate mousse is a downfall for me. I get away from that as quickly as possible. The next one is fully American sports debate thing. Like your top five windsurfers of all time. Top five windsurfers of all time. Wow. That's, you know, if I got to choose five, I'm going to go. Okay, I'm going to count Mark and Josh Angulo as the same guy, even though it's not. But that just for the sake of you're going to give me six because they're both on that list. Angulo, yeah, the Angulo, okay. let's call him. Paul Bryan. Uh, Levi Siver. You know, and, you know I'll, throw in a, I'll throw in room for a Traversa or... You know, I'm, I'm really, really into my Hokipa sailors. They're there, but, you know, things have changed. You know, a lot of good sailors. A lot of good sailors, man. Like, you know, I, I really, uh, I admired somebody with the fluidity at New School Christmas of a Mark Pere. You know, that's definitely somebody who I, I am amazed by his level. Uh, he kind of fits into a category Mark does that there's a couple other guys I would talk to you about that and I think the guy that I'm going to actually replace Mark with is Alessio Stilrich as my last one he's having a huge year flying around ripping like a madman in Pozo and healthy for the first time in ages and uh, what, I, what I'll say about Alessio is that what I see in what our gear has done for him at Simmer is so self-evident in that it's not just the gear, it's Alessio, but the combination, that's, that's undeniable. It's been you know, like one of those perfect symbiotic relationships that met right in the middle and then you had you know, your perfect performance. That list could go on and on, but we'll, 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 we'll cut it short there. That, and you know, the amount of ripping going on in that list is just like you know, what I've seen over the years sailing Hokipa with these guys, you know, and elsewhere. The the sessions I've had with Josh and Cabo Verde and what I've seen him do. Oh man, yeah. What I, I saw that answers, that answers the whether you're kind of a contest guy. You know, you don't have Dunker back in there. You don't have uh, you know, you know like, like yeah. I'm true to my roots, and 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 really, I think at the end of the day we all remember certain individual moments and performances more than we remember contest results. Granted, some of those performances occurred during contests. And there was a time where contests brought out the best in everybody. And that's what we're really trying to do with competition. Huh? We want that to be the best performances. You know, sometimes it is. And a lot of the times it's not. A lot of the times you're sailing a contest differently than you are free sailing. Yeah. So you're right. All of those really mentioned were uh, typically, you know, more free sailors for the most part, with a few competitive machines mixed in. I'll throw you. I'll, I'll throw you an extra one here, since you're a team manager. You get li limitless budget, and you choose five guys. Um, your perfect team. Wow. Like this day, this day and age. Well, we're going to cover all the bases, huh? 
You know, I would I would sign uh, I would sign Balls Mueller because uh, he's going to cover the alien stuff and throw it into this spectrum where he's in his own little you know corner. But it's we're just going to you know throw throw a little gasoline on his fire and just watch it go. Some of the most spectacular sailing being done is by him right now on foil or otherwise. Uh, no question. Then we're going to need to go to some. Well, you know, this is a good question now. I'm, I'm starting to think competition, but then all of a sudden I stopped thinking competition. No, we're going to need a world title out of that budget. We're going to need a world title out of that budget. We need one. Well, Alessio is our guy. We stick with Stilrick for the title. Based on what the current PWA tour is, we're going to need to whip, whip Alessio into shape a little bit, you know, on starboard tack. He's a great all-around sailor, but, you know, his forte is out there in port, which, you know, with, with the PWA tour, you never know. Could just be, you know, Zilt and Pozo again if we're not careful. So I'll put, I'll put up, you know, we'll, we'll put, you know, substantial resources into making Alessio, you know, a, a full time contender. And that's probably, you know, to me, maybe uh, you don't want to spread it any more thin there. But, you know, it depends a little bit. We're going to have to have a strong presence in Scandinavia. We kind of already do with Marcus Rydberg and Gustav Hogstrom, probably keep that going. Uh, you know, Noam high hopes for him and, and, and so much potential that, you know, he's on this list too. He's going to be, you know, the future, future star of that. And then we're going to need to go find a heavy hitting, ripping up and coming uh, female to round that out. Can't just be a bunch of dudes. Yeah. Sausage uh, fest. Uh, you about. know, yeah. And I, I, I don't know where I go with that because you know, what we saw with when we had Sarah and Justinia was, you know, a perfect mix of, you know, image and balance and, and, and ability and marketability and visibility. And so, you know, one was a little more competition based. One was a more a little bit freestanding Hokipa based. And, you know, for the Simmer brand, I kind of, you know, my air towards the side of a Hokipa sailor, wave sailor specialist again over the competitive machine need just for visual visual and, and just, you know, consistent, consistent output of maybe slightly more spectacular imagery. I don't mean to put the PWA down, but if you spend three months a year at Pozo, you might not be serving your purpose overall. You're getting good at Pozo, but there's a world of sailing out there that you're not, you know, covering. And something like Pozo, and even if something like Hokipa, you need to specifically dedicate to it. It's not just something that you can show up and sail well, you know, from day one. You have to start, you know, acclimating to it. That's a hard one. But there are a lot of really talented up-and-coming female riders right now, which is great to see. Uh, it's, there's a lot of talent out there. The dream team. The dream team. No, I wouldn't mind good. signing you, my check, actually. You look you look like somebody, you know, like I wouldn't mind putting on the team. I'll be honest. You're an all-around threat in everything you do. You're an underrated wave sailor. You're gnarly, dude. You, and you do it for the love of sailing, too. That's going to be the prerequisite for anybody. But wave I'm not here. For sure, mate. I, I, spend all my, I spend all my savings just traveling, chasing waves rather than, you know. Hey, well, I'll be devil's advocate. You can try a rig if you want. Maybe this is the start of a beautiful relationship. I don't know. But you look good, dude. And, you know, hats off to you because that's, you know, you're purveying this in, in the right way as well. You're certainly, you're certainly somebody that any team captain would look at very seriously. Yeah, I appreciate that. I yeah, man. Keep that. It, so, keep so, it. so before me, it was basically guys you already sponsor. So that's like <laughs> your like how you say like yeah you know just living by your by what you represent i guess you know i gave you all the money in the world and you came up with simmer guys so i guess yeah well you know there's something that uh, a, a term i've coined uh with my marketing director peter andrew i've worked with very closely here for close to 15 years now and it's are you simmer material and that has a lot to do with things and and some people are and some people aren't and uh, you, you recognize it quickly. And, uh, you know, the love of windsurfing has to do with the root of it all um, here at our brand. And, uh, you know, that, that pervades into a lot of really, really positive attributes later on when, when you realize you're doing it for the right reasons. You see, windsurfing back in that 80s era I was describing, 
People were making too much money. There, there were guys who were doing it for the money, not for the love of the sport. Literally, and, and maybe even to this day, though, I have a hard time believing that you would, you know, make so much money that you're only doing it for the money nowadays. But back then, yes, man. But these guys, they don't last, you know? So. No, they don't. They don't last. Hello. No way. Well, of course not. Yeah. You follow, the, you follow the money around to five different sponsors, and in 10 years, you look at an old magazine, and you don't even recognize yourself. Yeah. You just switch sponsors all the time. You know, you know people should be careful about that. Yeah. Most underrated windsurfer of all time. Pat Redman, West Australian sailor, sails Margaret River. I think he might be a kiter now, so maybe this this is one of them. But uh, I went to Margaret's in '99, and kind of anonymously showed up. I didn't, you know, you know, I knew I was in for something. That's a heavy spot, yes. and uh, you you don't you, what you do at Margaret's when you wave sail it. If you like, I'm gonna go down the line and outrun the section. No, 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 you blew the whole wave. You have to come from out of nowhere and bottom turn under that lip, under the cornice, much like we see the greats do, and get under the lip and throw. And I watched him, you know, over the course of a couple of weeks, and I realized, you know, I'm watching something here that's a little bit beyond reality. It's somebody who's so in tune with the break and his gear and his, you know, way of riding it. But, you know, he was a humble character. He showed up in this beat up Holden, rusted, barely held on. You know, it wasn't a pro sailor, it was a ripper, but man, you know, that, that, that serves to me as an underrated sailor. Uh, and, you know, there are many, many others. I think that if you get to the point where you would be considered underrated and you have the skills to be considered underrated, generally speaking, you've also then started building up yourself like a little bit. So you're not underrated because you know you're doing it. But another guy I'm going to mention, Luke Cyber, big time. And that's, you know, our, our backyard underrated guy right now because yeah. Luke does ridiculous stuff. And Luke, Luke sails at his own, you know, pace for his, his own pleasure, his own, you know, schedule. And it's, it's apparent that he'll turn it on when he wants to. He gets interested. He's going to start hitting big sections. But if not, he's out there going to go flip around with this inverted weird, you know, not, I can't even call it cheese roll because it's not, but he just does this ridiculous jump that's, looks like he could do it in his sleep. So yeah, it's very relaxing. To... Yeah, it's and it, it, it's somebody who's totally doing it for the love of it. And, you know, being the brother of Levi Cyber, obviously you'd be like, you know, Luke, when Levi and Luke were coming up, was kind of the gnarlier sailor for a little while there in terms of, you know, being older and filled into his body type and, you know, how big he would go. And then you watch a little brotherly competitiveness between the two. But Luke was the guy who didn't go for the, you know, big name sponsorships and the full blown career. And, you know, therefore didn't receive all the accolades that he might have had he gone down that route. But he, <laughs> what he earned in terms of like local street cred and respect from, you know, his friends, that's, that's worth almost more sometimes. Yeah. Just to give my two cents also on Margaret River, I think maybe I was pretty bad back then also, but so hard to time that wave perfectly. And like after, five days of being there i had no rigs left and every <laughs> every time every time you break and you swim into the river mouth you owe the boys a carton of beer so after two weeks i had no rigs and no money left because they were so freaking expensive as well and i was like barely you know i was i think 19 or something like that. classic dude chris partain and the boys are cleaning up on you that's too good <laughs> luckily i didn't have any of those swims I do remember once that on a slightly smaller day, I was up sailing by the surgeon's table and aptly named because that's where you were coming in on. And uh, Partain took me aside and said, Mike, if it was like two feet bigger, man, this, this place would knock your block off properly, mate. Don't go up there with your little back loops. It's a, it, I'd love to go back. Um, Sick place. But, uh, you know, the, one of my mentors, Rich Myers, and also a longtime simmer alumni, Rich Myers lives in Dunsborough. And I went and stayed with him uh, 20 years ago. And uh, I'm well, I really need to get back there. He has it mapped out. It looks like he'd probably still be sailing too. So cheers to the whole WA crew.
there's a good little simmer presence there as well. We're, we're, we're working with some really good people there. So cheers to you all. One spot you'd have to sail every day for the rest of your life. But you really have to go every single day. I have to go every single day. Yeah. You know, uh, probably the spot that I've sailed more than anywhere else, it's Hukipa. And uh, I say that because of all the different moods it has. Um, you know, I could make something up and say, I want to sell Punta Preta every day and then, you know, play God and, 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 and act like it's six feet and going 400 meters every day. And if it was, that would be my answer, but it's not. And, and, you know, like that's what makes it special. And some of these other places, even on Maui, like going to the West side when it gets good is that it doesn't happen all the time. It's the significance of these confluence of events that have to happen for it to happen. And it doesn't always happen. So Bukipa, you know, one form or another, you know, if I'm on a deserted island fishing and eating coconuts for the rest of my life, yeah, give me Bukipa because I, I, I know it's going to have a lot of different looks and it's probably going to have, you know, a lot of days. I think this is also not, not a little unwritten, goes a little unwritten. Like Bukipa can be side on, like, yeah, it can, yeah. It can be straight offshore, like freight train type where you just, you know, fly off a big section and you have all the power in the sail and whatever it can be like side on and you're you're wondering what the hell am i doing on a mast high wave when it's so onshore you know and yeah right. for, I, I for think... being yeah for being everything and all of the above wakipa has all these different looks and even for surfing you know maybe somebody from the north shore of oahu would come to wakipa and look at the best day of the year and laugh and drive away the fact is that if you can surf Hukipa well as a surfer, it prepares you for a lot of the other waves in the world because of its shifty nature, the amount of paddling that you need to do. Uh, a lot of these things will whip you into shape. It, it was something I took for granted for a while, actually, uh, when I was growing up here. That, you know, the, the punishment, I was just, you know, like used to taking punishment. And that's an important thing to, to have as, uh, on your or resume. It's like, you know, you can get pounded and handled. Um, that, yeah, that's I part like of surfing it. Too much hustle for not enough reward. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, sure. I mean, the environment, the environment here right now, we're, we're in a golden era. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tight knit crew of people. Uh, we're doing a lot of sailing, you know, like I said, it's a community, uh, you know, people I'm really grateful to, you know, be accepted and be a part of it. at the same time, you know, like we, we know what it's like in normal times and when the photo shoots come and when the contests come and, and, you know, what that does. And I think it's just a, you know, it's a reminder as to, you know, what it's part of the necessary uh, uh, elements of what, you know, drives the machine is competition and fo photo shoots and whatnot. And I think it, it's been a good thing to step back from and realize that, you know, give it some breathing room. Hukipa is going to need some breathing room. It's had some breathing room. These last nine months, it's been a lot of breathing room. And I think that, you know, people are hoping and, and wanting it to get back to normal to a degree, but savoring the moment as the same, because, you know, when the photo shoots descend and this contest descends, it is kind of BS for the local people here. And it is, you know, like, it's not like it was in 88 when you couldn't even see the beach because of all the slalom rigs, but you know, yeah, I, I feel oh, like no, you know, now you guys have it good for sure for the last, yeah whatever it was i'm trying what i'm trying to say is i'm trying to you know sit here and you know dangle it like ha ha I'm, I'm enjoying you know there's a crisis going on in the world but at the same time you know for me uh to be able to uh you know take advantage of, of first of all the situation i'm in and come here and, and you know definitely continue you know to promote the brand and and work on some you know prototypes and whatever and whatnot you know almost in a way like we had our aloha classic last week there are these like really good days i'm looking at all the guys i've sailed heats with over the years we're out there sailing together it was like we were saying to each other okay this is the aloha you know it happened and we didn't have a winner we all won basically yeah, yeah. and uh yeah here's to hoping that things just you know come back to a point where we're doing this next year and, and you're sailing your heats and maybe me and ben are up there yapping about it and you know, that whatever it takes. I'm, I'm pretty open-minded. Oh, but definitely a period like this, you step back and, you know, even what we're doing now, probably if we had a full on tour, I wouldn't be doing it, you know, because, you know, yeah. you know just do different things and it's, and it's, it's fun. It's fun for sure. Take the, take whatever, whatever is given to us, you know, somehow. I think it's ultimately been a really healthy thing. You know, I'll add that, you know, like the fact that we weren't doing our photo shoots last April to release next year's gear in July 
you know, things, you know, certain brands have, you know, stayed that course, but we at Simmer have definitely stepped into releasing our gear closer to the end of the year and dialing that part of the calendar in, you know, basically, you know, deliberately to normalize this process and get things a little bit more shelf life. I'm sure, you know, the people selling the gear in the shops appreciate that and want it to be a situation where, you know, we're able to, you know, promote the current product instead of just always switching over and switching over. And I understand, you know, the factory perspective or whatever it makes this work as well. But that's been really refreshing too. Yeah, it yeah. was kind of earlier and earlier and earlier. And I was like, fuck, we're going to reach a point where we actually going to kind of skip a year. Like we're going right. to, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're going to launch the I agree. 2022 gear in January of 2021. And then it's going to end up being 21 gear. And or I just, sure. actually, I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's crazy. Yeah. If it becomes this necessity that the newer is better, that's, you know, one thing you see companies like Ezzy who don't look at it that way. They just update their models and give it, you know, slightly different alterations. Simmer, I think we're taking a look at the board line um, a little bit more openly in terms of not falling into that wheel and maybe, up, you know, updating. You got to you give us some time to come up with something better. No, don't just come up with something new for the sake of it being new. No, you know, like let's work on this and make it better. It takes time. Maybe like once every two, three years, you update your boards and you come up with something that is, you yeah, know. like a new model, like cars or whatever, you know. Right, but I mean, yeah, it's funny. Like, it's the auto industry's fault. They're the ones who always come up with this, something new every year. And now windsurfing has to do it, right? Like, yeah, no, but, you know, but at I, the same I, time, you know, like if Fanatic has all the twenty-one boards available in Europe already. If you're not doing it, you're sort of falling behind in a way. You know, it like depends what brand you are. Um, if you're a brand like Simmer Style that has a dedicated following that's been using the gear for over 30 years, and we have people like we have people with tattoos on their arm, man. Like we're we're we got a dedicated clientele, and and they and they they're not going to wait forever, no. But they're also not going to buy something just because it came out and it's new. And uh, I also, you know, we might not have that clientele that keeps the sale for eight years either. Like, you know, some brands you see like, oh, we make the toughest sale out there. It'll last you forever. And it's like, okay, well, you know, you got, I have had, you know, who brags about, I've had this sale for eight years, you know, not, not many people. I mean, it's, it's, the turnover is important and it's, it's important to understand that, you know, gear will improve but it's also just the same fact that nothing feels better than a brand new sale. Right. So there's that too. Uh, Unpacking new boards is like the best feeling ever. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and we're, we're the lucky ones, you know, we get to do that. So yeah. anybody can, can, can live the dream and, and, and everything has a price. And I think that, you know, what we have right now is the ability to pick and choose the right gear for the right environment. And, uh, you know, as a fan of the sport, once again, it's, it's thrilling to see that diversity, though we're all after the same thing. Ultimately, it's this level of performance that enhances our lives and gives us, you know, more reasons to go out there, whether that's windsurfing itself as a sport or branching out into the other things that you can do as well. I think that, you know, back to Kyle Lenny. We're, we're doing a lot of different things at a really high level and, and, you know, the gear is part of it and, and not defining yourself in any particular category, but having your, your core sports anchored in, that's, that's where it's all about. I mean, uh, I don't, you know, turning 50 for me is going to be a trip, but like, I, I feel like now's the best time because it's like, you know, the, the, the enjoyment just keeps getting more and more. And that's, that's a really good thing to be able to say. It's you know, so like, sick to interview guys like yourself or Robbie Nash, like Robbie's well over 50 and he has so much stoke. I'm like, shit, so I can be that stoked for another 30 years. You, you know, can, like, you can, and just be realistic and take good care of yourself. You know, don't, don't destroy your body trying like stupid stuff, <laughs> you know, like, do, yeah. well, you know, you got to try. I mean, you, you, you're definitely, you know, out there to prove your, prove yourself, but you know, prove yourself over time, not just over one session. <laughs> yeah. Worst or funniest check-in story. Check-in story. Yeah. Oh man. 
you're talking to a drummer and a windsurfer. <laughs> okay. Funniest check-in story or one of them anyway. I've got I've got a really two good ones. Well, the first one's just at one point I was going to California for the summer and I was packing my drum kit and my sailing gear. And I had 13 pieces and somehow within it all um the travel agent told me yeah yeah your tickets at the desk well i'm like okay cool well she meant the desk at her travel agency not the desk at the airport so i had shown up with like 13 pieces drum set windsurfing gear and I'm like, hey bro you got my ticket by the desk and he's like no more buying them with my desk Anyway, so I, you know, I didn't have my ticket. This is like paper ticket time. I like, had to do the whole thing over again the next night. Pales in comparison to some of the stories that I've heard. Uh, but another good one was recently, actually, uh, this trip right now from Helsinki to Maui, I had uh, this board in a bag with five or a couple sails. I had a 30 kilo bag. Okay, I had my layover in San Francisco. Trip didn't start too well. You know, I'm in Helsinki with Lufthansa haggling a little bit. Like, you know, can I check this into Maui or what? And she said, no, no, you got it in San Francisco, you know, like, oh. I'm like, okay. they obviously don't know who they're dealing with here. Like, I'm just gonna, I, I'm, I, first of all, knew the forecast. There was no wind for like eight days. So I was like, I don't really need this gear. In the back of my mind, I was like, I don't need this stuff yet. So, I'm like, okay, I don't know. They charged me like, you know, pretty high for one bag. I got my, my gold, my, my, excuse me, my silver card. <laughs> and it's not doing me anything. And it's, it's so, you know, like check through the San Fran, fine. Okay, well, I get to San Fran and I've got, you know, something of an 18 hour layover to do, you know, a lot of things other than wait in an airport for my bag. Well, you know, I thought it out. I had a 50 minute connection in Frankfurt going over. So I'm like, I'm going to play the old, missing bag trick so i get to san fran and you know i'm like i don't really feel like carrying this thing around and i am going to just leave okay so i get my other bags i leave i go you know have dinner with my folks outside safe distance first time i'd seen them in nine months go you know go to my hotel room because i wasn't staying with my folks and i'm being extra cautious whatever get ready you know leave the bag i'm like i didn't even know if it made it or not I just like left it Anyway, so like, then I, you know, the next day I'm flying to Maui and, and you know, I guess I'll go look for my bag now, you know, over in customs. Okay. Well, I get this kind of like half-hearted response from the guys in customs who were like, you know, just, just fly to Maui and, you know, no big deal. I'm like, yeah, okay, no problem. So anyway, like got on the phone with United and, and Lufthansa were just basically like, yeah, you know, I need my bag now. And, you know, four or five days later it came. Perfect. That's my story. It was great. Yeah. Convenient story. No, no bad ending, nothing. Just let the system work for you. Don't worry about things. You know, the thing got you. I'm always, I've been always super tempted to do that because I heard like there's guys that just never pick up their bags and let the, you know, claim the missing bag and then let the, the, the airline or whoever drive it to them, you know, like even yeah. at your home airport. But I just never have the balls to do it because what if, what if they lose my, freaking boom bag with all my fins and all my foils or whatever you know it was a little bit of a gamble uh that's my favorite board right there and you know like yeah that, that didn't necessarily wasn't a great but you know panned out and I, you know, two thirds of the way there is pretty good you know like but i mean i, I the, the baggage stories are left and right but i mean uh, you had kp on here not that long ago right did that's he tell so you about, did he tell you the multiple bag tag story the, the the one that they manufactured the tags like they, they yeah they printed out the tags yeah that did was he tell you that that is yeah. that is the most legendary story of all time I and mean, we were talking about the FBI getting on you and stuff yeah that's amazing yeah that's amazing. And he, but he played it down you know the story grew to to a point where everybody thought he's like banned for life from from American Airlines and <laughs> and he had to pay like. My, like, yeah, and he had FBI on his ass and whatever, and he played it down. He's just like, yeah, I got a couple phone calls. I got my lawyer involved. I paid like five grand, and it was, it was over with, you know? So, well, for him back then, five grand was like uh, lunch money. Yeah, you know, but the point being that, like, what was worse, paying the, the actual fear and going through all that. No, that's the story, though. You start printing back tags, you're ahead of the game. I, I always respected that one immensely. Yeah. 
it could have lasted. It could have, should have lasted forever. Hey, Kevin, check in my bag for me. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, so yeah, you're making bank, but you still have that wind surfer mentality of like, let's save, you know, $50 a bag here, you know, and let's print. Or if it was just quicker, give them some credit. It was probably just quicker to tag them and not wait in line and deal with it, you know, go have a coffee or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, your worst competitor from your from your competing days. Oh, meaning like who I did the least well against? Or you hated to compete against, you know? Yeah, you know, um, there 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 were some healthy rivalries. Um, I, I mean, I, I never beat Polakow. I, I had some critical heats, uh, the 91 O'Neill. Um, I had uh, gotten to the semis and I lost to Polakow and, and he had, a, I think he had a pretty easy final against somebody I forgot who, but like, oh, for four, you know, like, and in critical spots. And I mean, like, you know, a couple times close heats, but most of the time, for some reason, like complete meltdowns, like my boom would fall off or some crap like that. But yeah, that's, you know, like, I won't even call him a nemesis. I'm just too fond of the guy and, and, and look up to him way too much to ever call him, you know, a rival or anything. But yeah. I mean, you know, like, in terms of a win-loss record, that's, you know, maybe one I would have liked to have gotten a couple on there, obviously. But, you know, it's Jason Polakow, so, you know, that's how it is. And uh, aside from that, you know, um, I've, I've kept it real clean. Um, and I guess that happens, too, when you win a lot of your heats. <laughs> But yeah, you know, like I can't say that there's been a thorn in my side that 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 I you know despised to the point where I had to like you know crush him in a heat. It's always I've always I've always gone about anything like that more with the Aloha style of like, hey, the water's really nice. Good luck, you know. Just say something bland and go out there and destroy him. No matter <laughs> who you. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? One thing I was about to do at one point, I might bring this back. This is back when I had my shark mouth boards. This is, you know, my military graphic that really caught on. I used to get five times as much coverage because of these boards. And it just looked like a shark jumping out of the water. It was, I wasn't doing anything. It was just the board. But you know, anyway, so what I was thinking was like, you know, I would start putting the flags of the countries of the competitors that I beat on the board. Like, you know, the ace kill, like, you know, a couple Aussies, there's a couple Japanese and some Frenchies and sure. Yeah, that, that looked good. <laughs> and having watched the last couple Aloha classics, I would say, like, in, in those, Hokipa was your worst competitor. <laughs> I have to say, like, something like when you look out of, like, when you're out of sync with the place, it can be like your worst, like your, yeah, your worst opponent, you know? Uh, it's crazy yeah i mean that that's that's you're only competing against yourself ultimately yeah um and and in in who keep his case you're 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 directly tangling with who and it was I mean, crazy to see for me because i saw you sailing there every day and just going miles out and picking really good waves every single time you know and and then i watched the heat and I'm like shit he's he actually he can be out of sync too you know <laughs> so, yeah, it happens to anybody uh yeah. you know it, I don't envy Duncan Coombs' position of having to send out some of these heats that he does sometimes, you know, enforcing it through. And it was an interesting situation last year when, you know, we actually halted competition with Brasinho in contention for a title based on the conditions, you know, midway through the double round. That'll be something that, you know, certain people will question and certain people will understand. And, and uh, you know, that, that what, what, what ends up being, you know, you see contests at Zilt that go left and right and back and forth in terms of, the, you know, like, that's just the reality of a place like Zilt. It's going to be good. It's going to turn on. It's going to turn off. And then all of a sudden you've had good conditions and you get to the final and it, ah. Well, it's you know, never like, good. It's contestable. It can be contestable. Contestable. And that's the fine line here is what's contestable and what's not. Yeah. And, you know, what, what ends up being that situation? I mean, I remember Brasinho certainly looking at it one way last year where it was like, okay, well, I can win the title if they just let me sail my heat. Yeah. And, you know, or a certain sailor doesn't. And, you know, there was Coster, which I remember vividly, earning his title based on winning at Hukipa. And, you know, like I have to say that, you know, had that not occurred, it would have been all for naught. But the fact that, you know, you threw Coster in the pressure cooker and made him win a heat or two or, th you know, whatever it was, that was massive. 
And that legitimized Coster to me. And not that he needed to legitimize, but it did. And it, it was something that, you know, you took it outside of his normal realm of domination, which was Pozo and some of these other spots. Yeah, if you, if you Googled or if you looked it up in the dictionary, like Euro Portuck Jumper, you know, you guys, as in the, the Hawaiian groundswell mafia, <laughs> you know, you kind of you kind of took him as a portrait of that, you know, and like make yeah. him on it here. Right. Well, sure. But I mean, look at the, look at some of the years, uh, you know, on tour that he got titles in, you tell me what tack that was involving. Yeah. Sure. You know, like sure. there, there were pork tack titles happening. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just as illegitimate as any, any Hokipa world title that's only based at Hokipa. The, the, the balance is the most important part. And that's my point behind all of that. Look, we got a we got a world out there. My check that like you know like there's a lot of good spots, and you know like there's the temptation to say, oh, this place is awesome. Let's have a contest. Okay, well that's not always the case. I mean, if you want to use Cabo Verde as an example, and a very good example really of a standard that got set back in nineteen in two thousand seven when they had that monumental event, and what happened there was you know era defining shifts were happening. I mean, Kali and his twin fin, the approach that he was taking to Punta Preta at the time, uh, able to ride smaller gear in a tighter than on the other side of the draw is Josh Angulo. You know, he's got a single fin, he's got his big sail, he's powering, power surfing it, big aerials, you know, connecting the dots, local knowledge. Well, anyway, the point being like this contest, like all of a sudden was just like, this is the best thing ever. Oh my God. Well, you know, they had a few other events there, but the standard had gotten set too high. Uh, yeah. You know, all, 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 all the, the, the preparation and prayer going on to make that event happen on Josh's behalf as organizer and competitor. Yeah. But I mean, like the fact that the conditions that were, that happened for those events, I mean, you, you would be led to believe that it's always like that and it's not. And so it's super hard to, you know, justify, you know, closing down Punta Preta for a, a specific period of time and expecting it to happen though, you know, they knew what they were doing in the right time of year. But what had happened was, you know, by the time, you know, the fourth year rolled around and, and it ended up happening at some odd time of year, like November or something. And it wasn't the right time of year. Everybody yeah, brought gear. Somewhere Everybody else. brought gear for 2007. There was this heat against Bogut and Josh that they re-ran like 10 times. Josh had a hundred five liter board, a six, two and a team of people shuffling him in and out of the shore break at Kural Jewel. And he was sailing effectively competitively enough. No one else had the gear he had. He had Vogue on a five Oh and an 80 liter board granted sinking to his ankles because there's nothing else you can do on it, on that equipment there. But Josh was linking turns and connecting it. But Duncan wouldn't count the round because why? Because it wasn't contestable. It's like, no, you know, sometimes you have to just swallow the bitter pill and realize that some people are like completely prepared for it. But, you know, I, really that wasn't, that wasn't the heat that broke the camel's back is when Flo Jung broke his ankle in the shore break coming back in in some crevice. And it was like, oh, no, we, this has gone too far and you can't hold condition, you know, can't hold heats in this. You can't do it based on that structure. So, I mean, Cabo Verde will always exist as this holy grail potential, which it always has, but it's as elusive as it gets. Yeah. And trust me, from someone who goes there and, you know, goes there, I live in Finland, you know, and, and go there when it's good because I can. I can make my decision to go there the night before. And like I said, I've got my gear waiting for me there for the most part. I bring a couple of sales of being the mask. I'm ready to go. And, you know, that that's the kind of place it is. You'd be led to the contrast of being like Maui with quantity over quality. Sometimes you get both. Whenever Cabo Verde is good. It's best ever quality. Yeah, that 07 contest, I think many people will agree is the best contest of, of all time. You know, it's like insane. Absolutely insane. Yeah, it was, um, it was historical. Yeah. You get a million bucks in cash and you need to spend it in 24 hours. What do you get? Okay. Uh, let's buy a house here on Maui, kind of on a, on a fixer-upper. We'll knock that one in. We'll get a Tacoma, store it in storage. We'll have kind of like a part-time Maui house. That we'll yeah, you can buy in. about a maybe a 50 meter square meter house for a million bucks there. <laughs> Definitely not a No, no, I, I would actually, I would just buy land. 
Yeah. I'm not going to buy a house. I'm going to buy land. I'm going to buy raw land and I'm going to, you know, long-term project. Uh, and you know, that, that'll be a good springboard for, you know, coming and going. It'll be good for my boys to kind of understand what the getting your fingernails dirty means and building something yourself. Uh, at that point, I think I would probably buy a little property in Cabo Verde. Probably still be able to, in this moment, be able to get something there. So yeah, I'd probably like try and tie up a couple properties and, 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 you know, maybe reinvest a little bit in, in simmer gear, maybe like, you know, come out with like a pro model with like a really hot construction and pay for it myself so that I get all the profit. <laughs> That's a good one. Strong arm the guys and be like, look, I paid for it. You just put your logo on it. I own, come on, this is me, man. And make it all about me. And then, yeah, no, but yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, I love no, just because of just because of the money. Look what started happening. I got some money and I changed. I was the I was like a real person before it all happened, and now I got the money and it's all changed for the worse. It's all about me now and my money. You got a lot of people on Maui, especially like that, who think that the money does the talking and that they can do whatever they want because they have money, and it's not like that. It just ain't like that. Yeah. We got a nice little rant for the end. Um, last but not least. Hey, but just a million? Can't you give me a little more? Yeah, I know. It doesn't. Can't you, like... can't you hit me with a hundred million so I can buy my Gulfstream G5 and so I can fly? I'll never miss another swell anywhere on the planet. Man, a hundred mil for that jet is not that much. You need to. You need the maintenance. What, what, what does it cost? It costs like a couple mil, yeah? And then you need to... You need the maintenance. You need the fuel. No, you can get you can get a G five fifty for like twenty million used. Just, you know, learn a little bit about aircraft maintenance, I guess. Yeah. Then you need to store it. You need the pilot. You're not gonna fly yourself. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna be like John Travolta, dude. I'm gonna have my own airport. So rad, dude. The guy's got his own airplanes. It's like, uh, let's go somewhere. Gone. Like I said, you, could you imagine, like, you know, the scope of things? You could just be on it, bro. 7,000 nautical mile range. Yeah. Oh, man. You wouldn't, yeah. You know, see, what, what strikes me is that, with given that capability, you might just end up settling somewhere and never want to go anywhere. Right? I mean, like, who knows what effect that would have? Yeah, because it's going to be too easy. It should be too easy. Like, ah, oh, nah. Yeah. But, you know, for surgical strikes to, to the key zones that we're only now beginning to understand, like, yeah, this would be a good time to do it. Yeah. Let's get a startup going, my check. You know, turn this podcast into something real. We'll get Ben to invest in it with all the money he's making at Windsurfing TV, and then we'll just we'll be on our way. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Now, maybe I, like I can be that. the third employee here. I'm looking forward to it, man. This, is my, this was my whole tryout. This has gone, this has possibly been your longest interview. I mean, has this not been like, am I breaking the record here? I was hoping. I don't know. I don't know. Jimmy Diaz was, was, uh, was quite, quite, quite long as well. I'm not sure what, where we're at, but we're over two hours for sure. Solid. Yeah. But it's fun. It, they go, they go fast. You know, it's like you, I don't know. I get into it and it's, it's all good. No, no, you, I, I, I could talk to you all day here. And that, don't think that you're tying me back from any sailing. I think today's one of the first days where it's actually just gone to trade swell. We're looking outside here at our haiku passing squalls. It's, you know, 1130 in the morning, but maybe not anybody out yet. It's probably, you know, at that one little moment where it clears and it'll get good. And yeah. Jimmy Hep will walk down to his spot and start shooting the local guys. And yeah. Life on Maui will, you know, permeate into what it is. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's such a beautiful thing, you know, like we're so lucky to just, just the simple things like that. Like, like, you know, this guy goes down there and takes pictures of everybody, you know, we're so lucky you know, to, yeah. to have that. And, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of set the model. Like you see that, you know, the Jose Pina guy doing it at Pozo or whoever else, you know, it's like everybody wants to see the world of windsurfing and, and, you know, it's not all just about Hukipa, but Hukipa does have that little, you know, place in our hearts that, 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 that always will be there. And I think everybody here looks at the outside world just as adoringly, like, look at all these other cool places you can go and like how good it gets at certain places sometimes. And yeah. Matt, you know, I think if the Baltic can do it, where else, you know, seriously. Yeah, let's not let's not compare Baltic to Hokipa, please. <laughs> <laughs> let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay, I will. Even okay, I just... it, it's it's ten thirty p.m. here. So, last but not least, who'd you like to hear on this show? 
Right on. Well, um, uh, have you had Campello on? Yeah. It's, okay, it that was funny. Him, that him was imitating good. Martin Brand there. Yeah, no, okay, uh, that's right. I remember that. Oh, that was. You made my I mean, day. We started the whole thing with Josh, which was a good way to go. Josh's interview is legendary. Yeah. Uh, I would love for you to have Mark Angulo. Bring him what on. Man. You're gonna you're gonna have a good long talk with a wise man who just you know understands very many things about where he's been and, and you know the, the rights and the wrongs of what he saw as you know the, his perspective is one of a kind. You'd have a long good talk with him. He's doing good. I speak with him all the time. So that would be my vote, Mark Angulo. Uh, and you know Keith DeBull would be a very interesting person to talk to. Uh, he's got a million, you know, stories from back in the day, but one of our contemporary, you know, pillars and icons on Maui, I think he's got a lot of interesting things to say. Who else? Let me think about that one. Um, how about Jaeger Stone? Oh yeah. Yeah, Mike. Ah, bring it down under Jaeger's Jaeger, you know, Jaeger's world title material, but he's also got a life outside of windsurfing and, you know, and, and a profession. And sneaky, outside of he's program. sneaky funny too. Like he, he'd grill you and you'd realize like after a week, you know, he'll give you a run for your money. Yeah. Bring on Jaeger next. That's, that's my final vote. Jaeger stone. Yeah. We'll work. Bring him on. Okay. Kai, thanks a lot. Thanks for the history lesson and for the unique perspective. And yeah, just for the sheer, uh, Talking ability, I guess. I'm, I kind of envy that. <laughs> Talking about you. anything, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, thanks for taking the scenic route on those questions with me. I, I, I know I, I bend, the, bend the rules of those questions. I, I, I have a lot on my mind, so I like to speak it. Yeah. And yeah, keep, keep ripping hard, my check, and everybody out there. And uh, let's get through 2020 in style here and bring a new year on us and a whole new set of adventures. Looking forward to it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, aloha. And there we go, Kai Kachadorian. I told you he could speak more than me. If you liked that episode, give us a thumbs up and leave us a comment who you want to see. Um, do you want to see any legends out there that you really want? We've got a long list. We've contacted a lot of people. We're just waiting for them to get back to us. But uh, hope you've been enjoying the podcasts. Um, like I say, give us the feedback. I'll put the links up above for old podcasts and maybe the whole podcast list. Lockdown now, so you can get into them. There's quite a few on there. Uh, if you want to chip in some beer money as well, support the channel and keep these things flowing, it would be very welcome. I'll put the link below. Uh, it's thirsty work. Uh, and there we go. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe so you don't miss the podcast every Wednesday, plus send it Sunday every Sunday. We've got a few more videos coming in. We'll see you next time.